Well, good morning. The Subcommittee on Communications and Technology will come to order, and the Chair recognizes himself for five minutes for an opening statement. Again, uh, thank you very much to our witnesses for being here today to examine the importance of AM radio receivers and vehicles. AM radio has been an integral part of our society for well over a century, connecting Americans to local news and serving as the backbone to our nation's emergency communications infrastructure. Over 45 million Americans tune into AM radio each month. They rely on it for local news, weather, sports, and emergency alerts. Its unique frequency characteristics allow signals to travel far and wide, overcoming geographical barriers and reaching both urban and remote areas. This makes AM radio an invaluable tool during times of crisis. When hurricanes, tornadoes, or other natural disasters strike, AM radio remains steadfast, providing vital information to those in affected areas when other communication channels fail. Back a few years ago when I was traveling through my district and it came on the radio, there was a tornado on the ground. I switched to my local AM radio station playing in real-time weather alerts that allowed me to know the exact path of the tornado. With that information, I was able to tra safely travel home, avoiding the storm's path. In times of emergency, information is power, and AM radio remains a primary source for emergency reports. Local broadcasters have long served as a trusted voice delivering real-time updates, weather alerts, evacuation instructions, and other critical information that can mean the difference between life and death. Beyond the emergency situations, AM radio plays a key role in local news and community engagement. From news and cultural events to sports coverage and talk shows, AM radio keeps us connected to our communities. These stations provide a platform for discussion, education, and entertainment. Importantly, AM radio reaches a wide demographic, ranging from seniors to rural and underserved communities. It serves as a source of information that is accessible to all, regardless of socioeconomic status or access to the internet. Today's hearing is a result of announcements made by many uh, auto manufacturers that they intend to remove AM radio in certain vehicles due to the interference between the AM radio receivers and batteries in electric car vehicles. As some manufacturers shared in response to a letter I led last month with my colleague, the general from Indiana 6th District, the electromagnetic waves emitted by an electric vehicle's battery interfere with the incoming AM radio waves, causing the sound to buzz and fade. To solve this interference, some auto manufacturers are installing shields and filters to protect the receiver against this interference. In other cases, it appears that uh, cars are equipping their new models with AM radio capability, but have it disabled. <coughs> However, some automakers are considering or are actively removing AM radio receivers from new vehicles altogether, regardless of engine type. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today about the public safety dangers of removing AM radio and possible solutions to combating signal interference. Removing AM radio receivers from vehicles means uh, individuals may miss out on critical life-saving updates. We must ensure that no community is left behind, no voice is silenced, and no emergency response is compromised. Again, I want to thank our witnesses for being here, and I now recognize the ranking member, the, the, uh, the subcommittee, the general lady from the 7th District of California for five minutes for an opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm glad we're holding this hearing today. While this issue has been gaining attention nationally, I think that this committee can help raise awareness among consumers. As I said in my statement announcing this hearing, AM radio provides Americans a crucial public service whether that's information during emergency local, local news or community-specific programming, AM radio delivers for consumers. While the media landscape continues to evolve, AM radio remains a mainstay for millions of Americans. According to the National Association of Broadcasters, 82 million Americans listen to AM stations each month. For these consumers, AM radio is indispensable. But even for those of us who aren't listening daily, AM radio represents a critical lifeline when disaster strikes. Americans know all too well the need for diverse and redundant emergency notifications. During wildfires, texts, and other mobile alerts provide information that can save lives. But these notifications only work when mobile networks are still intact and operational. If they fail, if We've seen after wildfires, hurricanes, and tornadoes, we must have a backup. 
That's where AM radio comes into play because assistant is resilient and spectrum can travel long distances. AM radio is a reliable backbone for emergency alert system. FEMA acknowledges this role when describing the emergency alert system saying, in many cases, radio and TV stations continue to operate when other means of alerting the public are unavailable, providing a layer of resiliency. Many subscription services depend on internet access and other public warning methods rely on utility power. In California, wildfires have destroyed cell towers and taken utility power down over large areas. For the many California families that have been forced to flee their homes without a mobile signal or power going out without, without AM radio, it would be unthinkable and unacceptable. Imagine in that moment with your family in the car, frantically looking for emergency information, only to find out your car doesn't have an AM radio. I don't think anyone should have that experience. With more than three, 30 million vehicles registered in California, the loss of AM radio in cars will represent a devastating setback for emergency communications. But we know AM radio is more than just a lifeline during an emergency. For many, it represents an irreplaceable connection to their community. As local news options grow few and far between, AM radio offers free, hyper-local journalism. From high school football scores to city council coverage, AM radio can provide consumers local coverage they can't get anywhere else. And in many areas, AM radio is broadcasting in Spanish, Vietnamese, and other languages spoken in the community. So in many ways, AM radio remains a lifeline. As we continue to push advances in mobility, it's important that we balance innovation with access. I'm hopeful this hearing will help us do just that. I'm excited to hear from our witnesses today, and with that, I yield the balance of my time. Thank you. The gentlelady yields back the balance of your time. The chair now recognizes five minutes. The chair of the full committee, the gentlelady from Washington. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to the witnesses for being here today. My constituents in eastern Washington rely on AM radio. It's how they hear the news in their communities, listen to sports, and receive information during emergencies. In many parts of my district, FM radio is spotty, and there's no access to broadband. So AM radio is the only option, which is why it's concerning that some vehicle manufacturers have taken steps recently to remove AM radios from new car models. This is in part a result of the Biden administration's rush to a green agenda as they push for electric vehicles because electric vehicle batteries cause interference to AM frequencies, resulting in bad reception. The decision to remove AM radio from cars would affect tens of millions of Americans. Some estimates suggest that more than 45 million Americans tune in to AM radio each month. While people in some parts of the country have been able to take advantage of alternative options in vehicles for accessing AM radio, like through a streaming service, many parts of the country still lack access to reliable broadband services, meaning this option is unavailable. That includes people in my community who are raising the alarm and sending the message that they like AM radio. They're concerned that they would lose access to vital information services like the National Public Warning System. Unlike its FM counterpart, AM radio signals travel long distances and pass through obstacles such as buildings, hills, and dense veg vegetation. These characteristics ensure that potentially life-saving information reaches a large audience, especially in rural areas with limited access to other forms of communication. The Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, has also worked to reinforce AM radio base stations to mitigate risk resulting from events like natural disasters. And rural communities in, in particular rely on the service provided by AM radio especially when they have only limited access to high-speed high speed broadband and stream services, or they don't have any access at all. These services are important. They're important for farmers and ranchers who use AM radio to receive information on the weather, crop reports, and other vital information for their livelihoods. AM radio fosters a sense of local identity 
connecting people through regional programming that reflects the unique perspectives and traditions of their communities. Local media on AM radio is closer to the people, telling the stories and sharing the perspectives that the national news doesn't always cover and sometimes ignores. And it plays a crucial role in government accountability, acting as a watchdog for local school boards, county officials, regional courts, and other government bodies. Further, AM radio continues to be a key outlet for talk radio shows to connect with audiences across the country. Rush Limbaugh, for example, had around 15 million listeners tuning in each week to his show, which was broadcast across 650 stations at its peak. These are vital sources of information that keep people engaged and connected to their local community, region, and voices and perspectives they value in their lives. Whether they're tuning in for the local news, agricultural, or weather reports, information during an emergency, or to listen to their favorite talk show personality, AM radio continues to be a popular way for Americans to stay connected. I look forward to our discussion today, and I'm grateful for our experts for being here on the panel to share our goal to both celebrate American innovation and ensure people can use this critical communications tool and listen to AM radio stations important to them. I yield back. Thank you. The general lady yields back. The chair now recognizes the ranking member of the full committee, the gentleman from New Jersey, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Latta. AM radio stations play a critical role in our nation's communications network, and that's why I was so concerned when some automakers recently announced that they were planning to phase out AM radio from their electric vehicle models. I know firsthand how important AM radio can be during an emergency. In October 2012, after pummeling the Caribbean, Superstorm Sandy slammed the New Jersey coast with 80 mile per hour sustained winds and rain. There was extensive flooding and damage along the coasts of New Jersey and New York, including many of the beach and bayshore towns in my district. States as far west as Kentucky suffered power outages that lasted for days. Communications infrastructure was heavily damaged, including 25% of cellular towers across 10 states. Now, some of my constituents went days without power and telephone and internet connections, largely isolated and seeking whatever information they could get. A number of them relied on broadcast AM radio stations to get up-to-the-minute information, like where to get water, gas, and groceries. And in some cases, their best source for AM radio was their vehicle. So that's why I was so troubled to learn that EV manufacturers had made the unilateral decision to remove AM radio from their cars. And as I understand it, without notice to consumers who have, for the most part, gotten used to having AM radio as part of a standard auto package. I'm proud of this committee's bipartisan work to encourage and promote more resilient communications networks, including my Sandy Act. And with the growing prevalence and reliability of wireless alerting systems, some people may wonder why we are concerned about the loss of AM tuners and cars, particularly given newer technology like satellites and IP networks. The answer is that AM has proven its value in emergency situations which is particularly important now as the worsening climate crisis unleashes new and more powerful storms around the country. Despite our continued efforts to make cellular towers and equipment more resilient, they're still vulnerable during extreme weather events. Last week when a typhoon hit Guam, preliminary press reports suggested that many cellular towers and FM stations throughout the island were knocked out, but AM stations stayed on the air. AM radio broadcast stations are the backbone of the emergency alert system infrastructure, which delivers critical safety alerts during public emergencies. During cellular network outages, AM broadcast frequencies are still able to travel 100 miles, 100 miles or more to deliver public safety communications. So it's no wonder that seven former Federal Emergency Management Agency administrators wrote to Transportation Secretary Buttigieg earlier this year urging the federal government to seek assurances from auto manufacturers to preserve AM radio access in vehicles for public safety. And we can't be satisfied by reliance on emergency content delivered through internet or satellite services that require a subscription or data plans. These services put consumers on the hook for additional monthly or annual costs. The government makes our country's electromagnetic airways available at no charge to broadcasters who then carry these important alerts and messages to the public at no cost. So we must ensure this vital information is free to consumers. 
Now, thankfully, AM content is not just emergency and disaster information. For most of the time, broadcast programming content runs the gamut. In fact, according to the FCC, AM stations are more likely than FM stations or other kinds of media outlets to be owned by women and black or Hispanic Americans. As we look to increase media diversity, we should keep in mind that AM radio is an important part of our nation's multicultural media programming. These are the main reasons that we simply cannot allow EV manufacturers now or in the future to remove AM radio from their EV models. So I want to thank Chairs Rogers and Latta, uh, Ranking Member Matsui, also Mr. Pence, uh, for you know, basically taking the lead in holding this important hearing and dealing with this issue. I also would like to introduce Lieutenant Colonel Chris DeMays, who was the commanding officer of the Emergency Management Section of the New Jersey Office of Emergency Management. Thanks for being here today. Over the years, he's also led emergency responses to hurricanes and other disasters throughout the country. So we appreciate you joining us today to share your expertise and perspective on the importance of AM radio to emergency management. And thank you for all that you do for New Jersey. Now, of course, I've been mentioning New Jersey quite a bit, but I don't think there's anything I said that doesn't apply to the rest of the country as well, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Well, thank you very much. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. Uh, we want to thank our witnesses for being with us today and taking the time to testify before the subcommittee. You will have the opportunity to give an opening statement followed by a round of questions from the members. I would like to note for our witnesses that you'll see the timer boxes right there in front of you so that when the light will turn yellow, you will have one minute remaining. And when it turns red, your time has expired. One other thing I'd like to note is we have a second subcommittee in energy and commerce running today. So we have members that will be stepping out to go to that committee, a subcommittee upstairs. So I, it's not that people are just leaving. They just have to go to another subcommittee. So I just want to uh, alert you to that. We have three witnesses for the hearing today, including uh, Mr. Jerry Chapman, President of Woof Boom Radio, uh, Mr. Scott Schmidt, Vice President of Safety Policy Alliance for Automotive, Automotive Innovation, and Lieutenant Colonel Christopher DeMays, Homeland Security Branch Commander, New Jersey State Police. And again, we appreciate you all being here today, and we look forward to your testimony. And Mr. Chapman, you are recognized for five minutes for your opening statement. Good morning. Chairs Latta and McMorris Rogers, Ranking Members Matsui and Pallone, and members of this subcommittee. My name is Jay Chapman. I am the president and owner of Wolf Boom Radio. We operate 12 radio stations serving Indiana and Ohio. Three of those radio stations are AM radio stations. In Lima, it's WCIT. In Anderson, it is WHBU. And in Muncie, it's WMUN. I also appreciate the opportunity to testify on behalf of the National Association of Broadcasters and more than 6,400 local television and radio stations that provide free and valuable service to our hometowns every day. I'd like to take a quick moment and share a personal story about the role of AM in times of a crisis. In June of 2009, I was the general manager of a group of radio stations in Rockford, Illinois. I was returning home that evening with our 11-year-old daughter, and she looked to the sky to the south, and she saw a glow. The, um, the few minutes earlier, before that, a train, a Canadian national train going through a suburb in southern Rockford had derailed. It was a, a train carrying 2 million gallons of ethanol at the time. 19 of the cars derailed, some of those cars leaked, and there was a fire that resulted quickly after that. That fire uh, ensnared the cars at a crossing that was right by that, and quickly people were injured, and unfortunately that day a life was lost. Within minutes of that derailment, our radio station started broadcasting news of it to the community and telling people what they needed to do. We worked closely with local officials to coordinate a response and direct people to safety. It was our AM radio station that night, WNTA in Rockford, Illinois, that got people to safety and explained what they needed to do that evening. As bad as it was, if it was not for the emergency management officials that night, working with everybody throughout that area, it would have uh, been much more tragic. I can tell you that AM radio that evening played a very important role in doing something that a cell phone delivering a text message cannot do at that time. AM radio explains, gives fabric and understanding
to an emergency situation. The AM radio stations also play a central, central role in our emergency alert system. The vast majority of the AM radio station or the PEP stations, which are the primary entry point, which fires at the beginning of a presidential alert, are AM radio stations. These stations have been selected because many of them have a coverage area of some 700 miles. AM radio stations also penetrate solid objects like mountains. FEMA has invested millions to make these stations withstand natural disasters and acts of terrorism. But the stations themselves are responsible in those moments for operating in times of crisis. A car is oftentimes the only source of power and news during an emergency. People depend on that. Unlike the internet and cell phones, which oftentimes go down in a moment of crisis, the AM radio stations and radio in general stays up during that. Despite AM's critical role, some of the automakers have removed it from electric vehicles, and there are also discussions to remove it from internal combustion cars. Broadcasters want to thank Chairman Latta and Representative Greg Pence and multiple members of this subcommittee for sending a letter to the automakers signaling the importance. Local broadcasters were also pleased as a result of this letter that Ford announced a decision to reverse its course. We applaud that decision. A bipartisan bill has also been introduced, and like other safety requirements, the AM Radio for Every Vehicle Act would preserve AM radio in cars by requiring the Transportation Secretary to issue a rule under which motor vehicles would be required to include a device that can receive AM radio. Broadcasters, of course, support this legislation. In conclusion, this is not a zero-sum game. We can protect Americans the way we always have with the dependable system of the EAS that works in times of emergency. We also can protect the interference to electronics and the occupants of cars as automakers have done for many years. But this moment right now is too important not to take this action. Thank you again for the opportunity to appear today, and I look forward to your questions. Well, thank you, Mr. Chapman. Mr. Schmidt, you are now recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Lada, Ranking Member Mitsui, Chair McMorris Rogers, and Ranking Member Pallone, and distinguished members of the committee. On behalf of the Alliance for Automotive Innovation and our members, I thank you for the opportunity to appear at this hearing today to share our perspectives on AM radios, and motor vehicles, and consumer access to emergency alerts. Alliance for Automotive Innovation was formed in 2020 and represents the full auto industry, a sector supporting 10 million American jobs and 5% of the economy. As the leading voice of the auto industry, Auto Innovators appreciates the continued engagement with your offices regarding consumer safety and the importance of consumer access to emergency alerts in motor vehicles. Our mission is to deliver a cleaner, safer, and smarter automotive future, and we take the safety of consumers and public seriously. We remain committed to ensuring drivers have access to free public alerts and safety warnings through the Federal Emergency Management Agency system, known as the Integrated Public Alert and Warning System, IPAWS. Access to emergency alerts under IPAWS is not limited to just one mode of communication. IPAWS was created to provide an in integrated services and capabilities to federal, state, territorial, tribal, and local authorities, and enable effective alerts to all communities. IPAW's mission contemplates multiple methods, including mobile phones via wireless emergency alerts, radio in terms of analog, digital, and satellite, and television via the emergency alert system and on the NOAA's weather radio. The system was designed to provide redundant alert mechanisms, assuring the public has access to multiple outlets to receive these critical alerts. The intent is for the public to not have to rely on a single source to receive the alerts. Rather, the goal is to create a safety net of information sources. The more, the better. Importantly, while access to emergency alerts is not limited to vehicles, drivers today are able to take advantage of the IPAW safety network. Regardless of whether these vehicles are equipped with a factory-installed AM radio, 
Vehicles can receive alerts through AM digital or high def radio, FM, both analog and digital, and satellite radio. Mobile wireless emergency alerts are also available in vehicles through connectivity to smartphones. Simply put, vehicles today offer a host of options for consumers to receive critical emergency alerts. Consumer trends show that 90% of today's cars come with factory installed systems like Apple CarPlay, Android, Android Auto, and satellite radio. With technology and new methods of reaching the public, Congress and federal agencies have taken actions to modernize the national alert system to ensure that these systems can adapt to shifting consumer preferences and include emerging technologies. Congress has already directed FEMA to modernize and future-proof the system, including emerging technologies. What's more, the FCC has noted challenges with analog radio's steady decline in listenership and reception issues. Finally, the IPAWS Program Management Office Strategic Plan emphasizes the challenges for the system as the public moves from radio and television as their primary mode of news. Technology advancements in the way the public consumes information is consistently evolving, and IPOLIS has made its goal to find ways to communicate with the program and public however and wherever they receive the information. There are many reasons why automakers make decisions in vehicle design and features, even when there is no mandate to include it, which is in case this is the case with AM radios. At the end of the day, automakers consider a variety of factors when designing and constructing cars, including prioritizing safety, efficiency, and addressing consumer preferences. The auto industry is pro-innovation. We are committed to ensuring drivers have access to free public alerts and safety warnings through IPAWS. Both the federal government and the automotive industry recognize that the ways in which consumers receive information will change over time. As innovation in the auto industry continues and new innovations are developed, the federal government and industry must work together to modernize IPAWS and it continue to incorporate new technologies. Doing so will ensure we collectively provide the best, most capable, and resilient technologies to the public while also strengthening public safety. On behalf of auto innovators and our member companies, I look forward to working with Congress and the administration to foster a landscape that serves the interest and safety of all Americans. Thank you. Well, thank you, um, Schmidt. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel DeMays, you are recognized for five minutes for your opening statement. Good morning, Chairpers, Ben Latta, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. On behalf of Colonel Patrick J. Callahan, the New Jersey State Police, who also serves as State Director of Emergency Management, I thank you for the opportunity to testify here today about this important issue and to deliver some opening remarks. I'm Lieutenant Colonel Christopher DeMays, Commander of the Homeland Security Branch of the New Jersey State Police. I also serve as the Deputy State Director of Emergency Management and have oversight of the New Jersey Office of Emergency Management. I'm accompanied today by Mitchell Stetson, who is a member of NJOEM's Communications Bureau and subject matter expert in emergency alerts and warning. I may be drawing upon his knowledge to answer some of your questions this morning. As set forth in the following testimony, NJOEM strongly supports the proposed AM Radio for Every Vehicle Act. The life-saving value of AM Radio clearly outweighs the incremental cost to improve AM reception in electric vehicles. NJOEM stands with our partners at the National Emergency Management Association, NEMA, in voicing our clear support for this bill. During the last few years, an uptick in severe weather events and forest fires has been concerning, not just in New Jersey, but across the country. At the same time, we have been seeing an increase in cyber crimes, active shooter incidents, and terrorist threats. In the face of this increasing threat scenario, alert and warning is the best tool we have to ensure the safety of our residents and to provide critical information before, during, and after disaster. This can include information needed while individuals are driving during a large-scale evacuation or during a power outage when individuals sit in their car to listen to essential communications. AM radio is a primary component of the nation's emergency alert system. The emergency management community at all levels in tandem with the private sector and broadcasting companies, has collectively devoted countless funds and personnel hours to ensure all members of the public can receive critical public safety information in a timely fashion. AM radio is embedded into the alert and warning and public information protocols that we have. NJOEM and our colleagues across the nation have developed and continue to develop plans that rely 
in part on continued access to AM radio. New Jersey is a very diverse state with rural farming communities, beach towns, and major urban areas. The extensive reach of AM radio signals and its high user acceptance ensure delivery to the widest audience possible. As a free resource, AM radio provides essential connectivity for many vulnerable mem members uh, of underserved populations who may not have the financial or other means to access internet-based or wireless communications. Public sources report that one-third of AM radio users are age 65 and older, the same age group that may be less likely to demonstrate proficiency with other forms of internet and smartphone applications. In some cases, AM radio stations may serve specific cultural and ethnic groups. The emergency management community is under a mandate to reassess and ensure that services are being provided to these traditionally underserved communities. And this is not the time to restrict access to AM radio and vehicles. In addition to serving as a primary communication mode, AM radio fills the need for redundancy as a backup for other primary communication methods. When there is a failure of technology or an underlying power or internet outage caused by severe, severe weather event or human caused condition. This requirement for redundancy is a basic tenet of emergency management and has well served this nation for decades. We're reminded of this with every hurricane, every tornado, and every snowstorm. Our belief is that AM radio is a critical source of information to our citizens during a crisis. We're investing in new technology to communicate emergency messaging in a variety of languages to our radio users and AM radio services have the ability to deliver these messages to wherever people are, at home, in the car. When disaster strikes, no one should lose access to this essential information because the vehicle being driven does not have AM radio. Thank you for your time and I look forward to questions today. Well, thank you very much for your testimony today. And that will conclude the, our testimony from our witnesses this morning. And I will begin the questioning this morning and recognize myself for five minutes. One of my concerns is how little notice has been given to consumers about the removal of AM radios and vehicles. Some companies claim to have announced the phase out of AM radios, but we've also heard reports that consumers are not aware that their new car doesn't have AM radio until after they've left the auto lot. In fact, the dealership in my district even told me that they had no idea about the change. And I'm, uh, I also want to say uh, thanks to Ford for its uh, change of uh, saying that the AM radio will be put back in their vehicles and also being able to be downloaded in vehicles that are already off the line or in have been uh, sold to consumers. Mr. Schmidt, <clears throat> excuse me. Should vehicle manufacturers be responsible to alert consumers when AM radio, a critical safety function of the vehicle is not included in the model before it's purchased. Can you repeat that a little louder? Right. I did have a hard time. Uh, should vehicle manufacturers be responsible to alert consumers when AM radio, a critical safety function in the vehicle, is not included in that model before it's purchased? Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, I cannot comment on individual what manufacturers can do, but I can certainly reinforce the fact that our members view um, that there are more options for delivering content and alerts now in vehicles than there ever were, and that we are committed to providing these alerts free of charge to our uh, customers through those vehicles. Um, Thank you. M Mr. Chapman, how do, you, uh, how do you think the removal of AM radios from, your car, from cars will lessen the reach and local impact of your broadcast channel? Chairman Latta, thank you for that question. Uh, it will absolutely uh, impact our reach in a significant way. Most of the radio listening is done in the car. Um, this is a, a business concern uh, for uh, many of our businesses in, uh, say, Delphus. Uh, we have uh, people that were the primary source of advertising for them, so they come to us to, use, to, to move their products. Um, so there's obviously a business reason for us, but there's a business reason for the community. And in addition to that, uh, if AM radio is not in cars, it's the primary point uh, that begins the alert system. So it's a safety issue too. People won't be able to hear the alerts the way the EAS system is set up. I know it's a little bit early for me for everything to be uh, noticed out there with the change, but have uh, you noticed a change in listenership right now in your station or stations? 
So, Chairman, Lada, at this point, uh, it's very early in the process. We have not seen changes, but I can tell you it will be significant because the radio is the primary entry point for people listening to it, and that's where people consume most of the radio. And so uh, if it's not in the car, it would be a significant issue for people hearing alerts or hearing news from local businesses. Well, let me follow up. Uh, we hear from many uh, auto manufacturers about how streaming AM radio is the future and there will no longer be a need for an analog or HD AM radio. What are your thoughts on that characterization? So, uh, for example, all of the Wolf Boom stations stream, but I can also tell you that streaming is uh, part of our future, but it's not all of our future. Uh, as uh, consumers listen to the stream, they might be hearing in an area that is far off. And so if they're hearing that stream, they're not getting EAS alerts for the area that are important, uh, that is the area of where they're actually residing at the time. And so uh, one of our concerns, if it's only streaming, we are still uh, running outside of the structure of the EAS system. EAS works with AM radio because AM radio can work in times where the power has gone away uh, AM radio can work in times of disaster, whether they are hurricanes or tornadoes. And uh, if a station is streaming, it is delivered over the internet and which is dependent on the power grid and also uh, other factors when cell networks go down. This is all part of streaming. So it is not a substitute for what we have, which is our primary uh, delivery system. Well, thank you. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel, let me ask in my last 25 seconds here, when you do your planning, because years ago when I was a county commissioner with our emergency management, we always have planning sessions. Do you plan for if the internet goes down, what happens then in your communications? I'm sorry, you have about 12 seconds left. Absolutely, sir. We have to plan for every contingency because Murphy's Law is governing much of our business and uh, failure of those networks is anticipated. All right, well, I appreciate that. And I thank our witnesses. And my time has expired, and the chair now recognizes the ranking member of the subcommittee, the gentlelady from California, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think about the AM radio, and it's something that most of us have grown up with. And a lot of things that we take for granted in this country, and probably AM radio is one of them. And uh, not only do we think about it and listening to radios and cars and things like that, but the fact of the matter today is that as we look at communications, it's become a very vital part of uh, what we do and for emergency purposes. Um, and rural areas like parts of my district, cell service can be spotty and simply non-existent. In these areas, alternative methods of communications help ensure that all residents have access to information when and where they need it. And I must say, not only in rural areas too, but in urban areas of which I have a great part of also. Um, what I was thinking about is, is that, um, can you describe, Lieutenant Colonel DeMays, the dis limitations of the other emergency alert systems when cell service or power goes down? And I think we can imagine it, but how that would happen. Uh, thank you for the question, ma'am. Uh, certainly, during these weather events that we've experienced in New Jersey and uh, nationally with high winds, uh, destructive forces such as earthquakes um, and other just snow load and, and heavy rains, we have lost cellular communications pretty frequently. And unfortunately, um, we've become so devoted to them that we kind of lose sight of the fact that we do need to rely on other mechanisms to communicate with the public. So as mentioned uh, in Chairman Lattice's question, I wasn't able to quite you know, maybe expand upon, uh, we require that redundancy to make sure that we can communicate with all of the community. And the AM radio platform certainly has such a broad reach and is re reliable and uh, robust uh, that we've leveraged that many, many times to communicate with a broad spectrum of people in both those rural areas and in the urban areas throughout the state. Right, absolutely. Um, the frequency used by AM radio are, is different than FM or those used to power our phones. While they have some limitations, they also have strengths that have helped AM radio reach consumers across the country. Mr. Chapman, can you describe the unique characteristics of AM radio frequencies and why they are so well suited to emergency announcements? Thank you, Congresswoman. The uh, 
AM band is somewhat different than, for example, the FM band. AM waves are much longer. The uh, FM waves are much shorter. And in uh, layman's terms, what this means is they can travel greater distances. They can also penetrate things like uh, hills, mountains, and such. And so uh, many years ago, when FEMA and broadcasters decided, what do we want as the primary point to activate the emergency alert system? They selected AM stations for this very reason. So the entry point to begin a national alert is primarily AM stations. And for example, the one that is in my area that reaches all of the Midwest is uh, WLW, and it covers some 17 states. And uh, this is the reason AM is so central to the EAS. All right, thank you very much. Um, I'm talking local economy, whether on TV or radio, local broadcasters provide opportunities for smaller businesses to reach consumers in their community, especially in smaller media markets. This can be an engine for economic growth. Mr. Chapman, can you talk about the opportunities AM radio provides for smaller local businesses? How would those opportunities be limited if AM radio were removed from all vehicles? Uh, thank you for the question, Congresswoman. Once again, it's a question of access. And so uh, I mentioned a radio station that we have in Anderson, Indiana. During the middle of COVID, we went on the air and you know, in the old days of doing a radiothon, we started selling cards, gift cards to businesses to put the money back into the community. Um, so that is central how it's the economic engine a lot of times, and that's an easy example to understand. Um, one that's uh, also uh, important is there's diverse listening that was mentioned somewhat uh, earlier. I was fortunate uh, a number of years ago to be a general uh, sales manager for a black gospel station in Indianapolis. And that radio station was central to that community. Um, not only the businesses, but the information that was communicated to the people uh, that listened to that radio station. So it was important uh, as they saw the information that came through the radio at that time as credible and reliable. And that's an important relationship that exists between a radio station and its listener base. Okay, thank you very much. And I yield back. I thank the gentlelady. She yields back. And the chair now recognizes the gentleman from Florida for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is a very important hearing. I appreciate you holding this. And also, I want to thank the ranking member, and uh, thanks for the testimony as well from the panel. Uh, as we kick off hurricane season this month, I'm reminded of the all too familiar situation for residents in my state of Florida. The electric is out, the internet is down, the cell phone coverage is shoddy at best, and if people heard my PSAs over the years, they would know to have an emergency handheld radio at the ready. But if not, they head to their cars to reestablish a connection to their community, hear about the devastation of the storm, and heed any direction from emergency services, uh, service authorities. So my question, first question is to uh, Lieutenant Colonel, to the Lieutenant Colonel, what benefits do AM signals have over FM signals during and in the aftermath of a natural disaster such as a hurricane? AM signals uh, in and of themselves have much broader reach, as mentioned before in prior testimony here today, that they can reach greater distances uh, than the FM signals can. Uh, so we can penetrate some of those more rural areas, uh, but also as mentioned, uh, the ability to also penetrate you know, buildings within some of those urban centers is, is makes, it, makes it certainly a little bit more uh, amenable to those types of messaging. Very good, thank you. In uh, 2016 legislation I authored to modernize the uh, FEMA's iPod system became law. That legislation improved the effectiveness of the texting system for uh, future emergency situations and implemented training requirements for state officials. It also relied heavily on the emergency alarm system and AM radio signals to work quickly and effectively. So again, Lieutenant Colonel, in your professional capacity, do you foresee potential delays to emergency information 
getting to citizens as a result of lesser access to AM radios. Uh, and it is, a, is it possible to replicate our EAS system without the use of AM signals? And this is so very important, as you know. I mean, uh, we could lose lives uh, without, without the AM radio. Uh, so please, if you could uh, respond to that, I'd appreciate it very much. Uh, thank you, Congressman. Uh, yes, so I would agree that to lose the access to AM radio signals uh, certainly would impede the messaging getting out. Uh, whether it is a cellular network collapse, a power outage uh, that impacts the cellular infrastructure, uh, the potential is that those messages in text form would be cached and not delivered directly to the people that might need them. Uh, certainly, we need all platforms available uh, to our residents because you know, some people are more comfortable listening to AM uh, radio stations to obtain their information. And we want to have all messaging platforms available. So any delays in getting that message out in that critical moment certainly could be a matter of, of life and death uh, as a part of the emergency alert system. Absolutely. Uh, and, and then uh, getting into the entertainment aspect, uh, people are used to, particularly in the rural areas, and I represent rural areas, um, not all of my district, but quite a bit, two counties, uh, and they are used to, the people are used to listening to AM radio. That's where they get their news. Uh, and uh, I tell you what, if, if we don't save uh, AM radio, Mr. Chairman, um, I tell you what, it would be very devastating for a lot of people, particularly our seniors. And, and I'll add that uh, I love to listen to AM radio, uh, listen to baseball games. Uh, and and it, radio is, actually baseball is a radio sport if you can't go to the game. So uh, that's from a selfish point of view. But in any case, uh, this is a serious issue and I really appreciate you having this hearing. I'll yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, the gentleman yields back, but I think your team's doing better than it did last year. My team's doing pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there we go. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, the chair now recognizes the, my in order here, let's see here, the general lady from California's 16th district for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the ranking member for holding this hearing today. Thank you to the witnesses. Uh, there's no question that many Americans value uh, AM radio, which is why it's been a standard feature in cars for so many years. Uh, while drivers now uh, have several options for uh, listening to music, podcasts, and other entertainment while driving, the backlash to uh, Ford removing AM radio, which they've now walked back, uh, shows there's still um, a really robust uh, consumer demand for this feature. Uh, just as importantly, I think this episode shows that uh, automakers are responsive uh, to the demand. Uh, that's how the free market is supposed to work. While there are many features that drivers may want in their cars, uh, the only ones mandated uh, by the federal government uh, are those intended to keep us safe. Uh, two of the witnesses uh, today have endorsed legislation mandating AM radio as a safety feature to ensure the public can receive uh, emergency alerts during natural disasters and other emergencies. Uh, NHTSA has more than a dozen outstanding safety regulations mandated by Congress that it has yet to implement. And some of them uh, have been pending for more than a decade. I think uh, the Energy and Commerce Committee needs to get after uh, NHTSA. Uh, uh, before we add to that list, uh, I think we need to be sure that any additional mandates are truly needed to improve safety and uh, safe lives on the road. Uh, to Colonel uh, DeMays, uh, is AM radio the only means for, um, or primary means by which uh, drivers can receive emergency alerts through the integrated uh, public alerts and warning system? Um, thank you for the question, Congresswoman. Uh, they can receive messaging through the FM 
uh, system as well. And also, uh, if they have a cellular device available to them, certainly they could receive messaging through that platform as well. Thank you. Wireless emergency uh, alert system. Thank you. Uh, to Mr. Schmidt, what are the potential unintended uh, consequences of Congress mandating uh, the use of a specific uh, technology to receive uh, emergency alerts? Thank you for the question. Uh, yes, uh, as you're well aware, uh, mandates and regulations are blunt instruments. Um, and so it's important that we look at the cost and benefit over a uh, future. And one of the things that FEMA has noted is that there is declining li listenership. And part of the whole IPAWS system is looking at the future in terms of what new technologies are going to be able to supplement maybe AM, uh, potentially in the future even replace AM and also to deliver more effective um, alerts. So we are very technology agnostic in the sense that we are looking for delivering the alerts to our members, to our customers, as efficiently as possible, as broadly as possible, in the most efficient manner, and in a manner that's not going to decline in the future um, and will provide the benefits uh, well into the future. Thank you. Is there a, uh, this to any of the witnesses, uh, is there a technology uh, neutral approach Congress can take to ensure that all drivers have access to emergency alerts? Yes. If, if Congresswoman, if I may answer that sure. for a second. Mm -hmm. uh, FEMA many years ago, uh, as they were constructing the current model for the EAS plan, used AM radio stations as and I referenced this earlier as the primary entry point. And they did that for a couple of reasons. Number one, we've already talked about the distances that AM radio stations travel, um, but it's also some of the characteristics. So um, in the event of a significant disaster that we haven't experienced, these stations reach more than 90% of the United States. So they're the central point. And so there's not another technology or another medium right now that's ready to step in and replace that. Any other witness here too? Uh, Congressman, I agree with this statement. It really is, as, you, as was mentioned, several uh, witnesses today stating that it is the backbone of the emergency alert system. It's the most consistent, uh, dependable platform with which we have to communicate with the public. Yeah, I just kind of just make a mention that, you know, they, my understanding from reading some of the FEMA documents is that the EAS system is a fairly cost-intensive system to maintain. And I think the key thing is how do we make that more cost-effective as we move forward? And as we look at, assist, at uh, technologies that may be declining, we need to find alternatives that can address that in a more cost-efficient manner and still deliver the safety benefits. Why is Thank it you. so expensive? I don't know. I just noted it in there. Um, well, first off, I think the idea is that you have these hardened stations. Um, and, and like I said, they're not just AM stations. They're other stations. And uh, I don't have the specifics on that, but it is in, the, uh, in their documents. And if you want, I can probably fold that reference and get it back to you, and that would be helpful. I'd appreciate Thank that. Thank you. Thank you to the witnesses. Mr. Chairman, I yield back the balance of my time. The gentlelady's time has expired and yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentlelady of the full committee for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In the announcement, Mr. Schmidt, in the announcement Ford made on May 23rd, they stated, quote, for any owners of 2023 Ford EVs currently without AM broadcast capability, we'll offer an over-the-air software update to make it available. How was Ford able to turn on AM broadcast capability with the flip of a switch while other car manufacturers are not? Thank you for the question. Um, let me give you uh, Ford's, what they told us, and I think they've mentioned this to the community as well, because in their May 23rd announcement, CEO Jim Farley announced that after speaking with policy leaders about the importance of AM broadcast radio as a part of the emergency alert system, Ford decided to include it on all 2024 Ford and Lincoln vehicles. And for any owners of 2023 model year Ford EVs that did not initially offer AM radio, they will offer a software update. It's my understanding from discussions with Ford representatives that Ford started removing AM radio by disabling the software while they worked to, on a longer lead time modification that would actually remove the hardware. So for those models, Ford can, in, can enable the AM radio by via the over-the-air update. 
However, I can't really speak to any of the Ford's plans for post-2024 at this point. Are you aware of any other auto manufacturers who are choosing not to provide AM radio despite having the technology and the capability to do so? I haven't, we haven't done a census to see which vehicle manufacturers are or not. This has been something that manufacturers look at customer preferences very closely, and so they do a lot of market research and try to determine what, how to deliver the most value to the customers. Okay, thank you. Do you have, do, you, uh, do any of the companies in your group plan to charge extra for AM, FM radios and cars through a subscription service? Yeah, I really can't talk about, you know, content. I talk about the safety. And so we're committed to providing free alerts um, as far as the content. There's, as, as you know, in, in, in any, um, in this realm, there's a lot of free content, a lot of subscription content for everything. So again, that's a consumer preference, a marketing thing that our manufacturers look at. But I can say that we reaffirm that we are committed to ensuring drivers have access to free public alerts and safety warnings through the iPod system. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chapman, a, a large portion of the most popular AM radio shows feature either conservative or religious content. From your perspective, what effect will the removal of AM radios from cars have on the diversity of thought in the broadcasting space? Thank you for that question, Congresswoman. Uh, I'll pull on a couple of examples. I have a station in Muncie, Indiana. It's WMUN. We recently reprogrammed this station. Uh, it's somewhat cost intensive, um, but we focus on local community issues. It's important that we have a place for the fourth estate to act, to talk about public issues. Uh, like a lot of the communities in the Rust Belt, uh, this town has been somewhat challenged over the years, but if there's not the place with the declining forms of other media to discuss these things, we can't depend on social media to help a community shape its decision. So it's a role that we need to play as a broadcaster, and that's something the AM stations do really well. I had referenced a little bit earlier that when I was a general sales manager of an urban formatted station in Indianapolis, we worked very hard to address issues that were specific to our station um, and our audience. Um, I've got a good friend who operates a radio station. He's a member of NABOB in Evansville, Indiana, at Lander, WEOA. And his station uh, puts information out that would not be received by his listeners and that community because there are not other sources for it. So the diversity of voice and the diversity of thought is very important, and the AM band does that better than any of our other vehicles. Thank you for those insights. Uh, another question, the U.S. has invested significant capital into hardening certain AM radio broadcast stations to prepare for a variety of crisis scenarios. Can you speak to what goes into the process of hardening an AM station? So as a, thank you again for the question. As a general rule, um, each station, each opportunity for FEMA and that broadcaster is unique. For example, if it's a station that's in, uh, on the Gulf, uh, it might be on stilts and up in the air if a hurricane comes through. That's to protect it because in the past when that's happened, for example, during Katrina, um, stations were not able to stay on. So that investment has been made. Uh, generally, with any PEP station, which is, again, the primary entry point, uh, 30 to 60 days of alternate power are at each one of those facilities. So um, it's very different than might uh, a station in the Midwest that might be set up to survive some type of a terrorist act, such as an EMP or something like that. That's a lead-encased facility. So it depends on the radio station. And I know that's not a direct answer, but each one of these stations is somewhat different in terms of its requirements. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone. I yield back. Thank you. The general lady yields back. The chair now recognizes the general from New Jersey, the ranking member of the full committee for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. In times of emergency with the stakes so high, we can't ignore the fact that reducing the, num the number of platforms and technologies available to us for warning the public makes the job of emergency managers and first responders that much more difficult. So let me ask Colonel DeMays, why is AM radio a critical piece of the public warning system in New Jersey, and why is it short-sighted to reduce the number of options available to public officials for communicating with the public in future disasters? Thank you, Congressman. The, the redundancy as a major tenant 
of emergency management is something you know we try to focus in on. We need to have multiple platforms available to us, whether it's power uh, delivery, uh, we have generators or other sources of energy for homes, water being bottled water, water buffaloes, et cetera. And from a communication standpoint, we want the maximum amount of platforms available that meets the users where they're at. The AM radio platform is, again, highly accepted by its audience uh, and trusted, for that matter, and we want to communicate with uh, those individuals through that platform if they're not maybe paying attention to those cellular platforms, television, et cetera. So we lose that connectivity with that very large audience uh, during a crisis. Oh, thank you. Thank you for being here. Let me go to Mr. Schmidt. I, I was glad to see you emphasized your member company's commitment to ensuring drivers access to free public alerts and safety warnings. I did not, however, hear a commitment to ensuring access to free information and entertainment like that currently enjoyed from broadcast radio. And while I appreciate those who point out that most radio stations are available to stream via apps on our phones or through the vehicles, these suggestions ignore a simple reality that not everyone has or can afford unlimited cellular data plans to support that level of sustained usage or additional subscriptions for their cars. So we don't want this to be another issue exacerbated by the digital divide. So my, my question, Mr. Schmidt, is how will people without unlimited data plans or paid auto connectivity subscriptions access broadcast radio content without the standard antenna in the vehicle? Thank you for your question. Um, again, as I reiterate, um, consumers have never had so many choices in where they get their content and information, including alerts. Um, I can't comment on necessarily what would be subscription or not subscription. However, I will say that we, our commitment is that there will be free options in that vehicle. And even within things that do have subscriptions, such as satellite, their alerts are free on their base channel. So they're provided without um, fee, even if you don't choose to subscribe. Thank you. I mean, the problem, though, you know, is that we know that with AM, I mean, it's essentially free. Um, we don't know how people who have limited means are going to be able to use some of these other things that might have a subscription or, um, you know, limit. They might have, they may not have unlimited cellular data plans. So I understand what you're saying, but I also think that, you know, we have, in the case of broadcast radio and AM station, we know that that's not something they have to pay for. Um, let me go to, um, uh, to Mr. Chapman. Can you describe what would happen if your business had to rely primarily on streaming broadcast? How about the hardship streaming would place on working people who regularly tune into your stations? while commuting to and from their jobs. Thank you, Congressman, for the question. Uh, a number of our listeners would no longer hear our stations. Uh, the easiest way to consume our product is free over the air radio. Um, a streaming option is something that all of our stations have, but it's not that way for all broadcasters. There's a cost that goes with streaming. So for smaller broadcasters, uh, for smaller operators, a standalone radio station, they may not have that option. So it would be a significant hit for our business. Um, it would lower our reach, and we're talking about safety here. We're not as going to be accessible, um, but for some broadcasters, it would end their business model. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you all. And I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The gentleman yields back, and the charter now recognizes the gentleman from Michigan, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, public safety, uh, public benefits beyond safety, two pillars of what we're hearing about the importance of AM radio. Uh, Top-down mandates are not, I believe, the way to approach this issue, but it's important that we properly identify uh, what AM radio means for our constituents and the impact that uh, its removal from vehicles would have. Um, I think the fact that AM is free is something that ought to cause all of us to sit up, sit up and take notice. And thank you uh, to the panel. Thank you for uh, dealing with our concerns, our ideas, and questions today. Um, the free service that AM offers requires no internet connection, reaches parts of the country, and people that streaming and other services cannot for various reasons. 
Um, this is how people in rural areas like my district uh, get their news. They connect with their religion. They raise money for local causes. They take part in diverse conversations that they might not otherwise have access to. Uh, Mr. Chapman, over half of all people only listen to radio in the car. I listen in the shower as well. We'll leave it there. Additionally, AM, FM radio is still the top listened to media in cars over, over both streaming and satellite services combined. Uh, not all automakers have plans to eliminate AM receivers, and thank you to Ford, I think, for listening, and I hope they'll continue to listen to that and expand the whole network of free radio by doing so. How could the rhetoric around removal impact investment in and availability of AM radio programs? Congressman, could you repeat that very last part of your question, please? Uh, I was asking how the continued rhetoric around removal of AM uh, impact investment and avail availability. So, uh, you know, as, as far as the, Congressman, thank you for the question. As far as the view or the rhetoric, um, uh, you know, it obviously uh, would look, you know, for anybody uh, wanting to invest in our sector, question what's going on. But I, th I think the bigger question for us is, as an industry right now is, how do we make sure that we can connect with people at all times who want to receive us? Um, and we know um, that we do the best when we are uh, received over the air uh, through the channels that are easiest for people to receive it. So, um, you know, uh, we've made a concerted effort to be available everywhere uh, for uh, people so they can consume our product. But the vast majority of listening that occurs to radio stations is where it's broadcast free and over the air. Yeah, and that's an investment option that ought to be trumpeted. Um, um, Mr. Chapman, um, Michigan has a rich AM history. In fact, the first commercial radio station in the country started here, or started there. I guess I'm always living in Michigan. Our AM stations cover things important to Michiganders, uh, whether it's a fundraiser for the local Salvation Army, uh, or minute-by-minute -minute updates on flooding in the state, or now wildfires up in, in the northern reaches of our state. Uh, there's been a trend towards uh, media con consolidation for decades, making news less local. That wouldn't work in Crawford County right now with the fires if we weren't local. What is the AM radio's role in local news and keeping people in rural areas informed? Congressman, we have made significant investments uh, in our news operation. I'll touch on those in a second. We started our company uh, on the premise that locally owned and uh, locally managed radio uh, where we operate is the right way to serve the community. Um, that is our business model. Um, we know that we need to continue to invest in our news. We've uh, upped the staff in that. Um, we operate in small communities, and we also operate in rural areas. So the news aspect and the information aspect that we provide the community is an important part of our service. That's why many of the people in our organization come to work every day. They see that as a role to serve the community. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Schmidt, uh, how much does it cost to include an AM radio receiver in a newer electric vehicle? Yeah, unfortunately, I don't have cost information that is specific to vehicle manufacturers and it also is very specific to the vehicle design. I can say there's probably a range um, because some of the issues with interference may be more and more or less uh, prevalent, but I don't have any specific cost information. Sorry. That leaves us at a loss as well because we don't understand it. So thank you. I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Florida's 9th District for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In my first couple of years in the Congress, we had Hurricane Irma, which uh, <clears throat> pummeled Central Florida with heavy winds and some rains, and we saw trees down everywhere. Uh, we got hit again with Hurricane Ian just recently. Uh, this time it was more flooding and uh, standing water for many days. And we often tell our constituents, as does the state that and our local governments, that we need to be prepared, uh, have adequate supplies. And one of those key supplies is a battery-powered radio. Uh, it's right there on our list, on the federal list, on the state list. 
because redundancy is critical, uh, especially for our emergency alert system. Cell phone towers, cable, electricity uh, can all go down. And AM is the last line of defense when we're talking about critical information, evacuations, power outages, down power lines, curfews, flooding, um, need of help uh, to clear the way for our first responders. And AM is also a key part of uh, our Hispanic culture. Uh, many of my constituents access Spanish language programming, news, culture, music uh, through AM radio. And it's only heightened uh, in uh, our US territories, uh, all of which are islands like Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands, and Guam. Uh, when all else fails, AM seems to be there to pick up the slack uh, during a lot of these natural disasters. Obviously, a lot of us were concerned when um, major auto manufacturers uh, had, had started considering phasing out AM radio. Uh, some have reversed course, like Ford, and we appreciate that. We uh, encourage others to follow suit. Mr. Chapman, when, when all else fails, how essential is AM radio uh, during a natural disaster? Congressman, thank you for the question. Uh, the central point in a large disaster depends on PEP, or primary entry point stations. The majority of those, 75%, are AM radio stations. And again, it was the design of the system at that point in time, which they continue to evolve today, that they made it uh, essential for AM radio stations because of the things we've already discussed to be part of that. Um, uh, in more recent times, uh, when we're dealing with local alerts, it's only the AM stations that go into great detail. Two quick examples. Uh, recently in Alexandria, which is just north of Anderson, Indiana, uh, twice uh, in one month, we had what we believed was an active shooter in a school. It was only our AM radio station explaining at length with reporters on site what was actually happening to keep the public calm because it was not what was being put on social media. In that example, it's a prime situation of how AM radio serves in a time of need. Uh, just a few weeks ago in mid-May in Lima, Ohio, uh, the prison there had two extremely dangerous felons escape. Uh, in that moment, it was our stations and our AM station that were providing not just alerts, but were providing the background and the information so businesses and different organizations could keep their population safe. Thank you so much. Uh, Lieutenant, DeMay, Lieutenant Colonel DeMays, uh, how critical is uh, AM radio stations for new vo vo motor vehicles for ability of Spanish-speaking communities in New Jersey or in my home state of Florida or others to receive emergency alerts? Thank you, Congressman, for the question. As mentioned, uh, we like to message out where those communities are at and the AM uh, radio stations, being able to share those messages with our people is, is of critical importance. From a motor vehicle standpoint, it's not uncommon, as in the case of Hurricane Sandy, for us to engage in evacuations of areas. And having that ability to communicate with people that are on the move uh, when cellular networks may have been compromised uh, due to high winds or other destructive measures, uh, or in the case where there's power outages, and those systems maybe aren't able to uh, leverage and, and communicate properly. The AM platform provides us with a great deal of connectivity with those in the community that are on the move. And in some cases, as we've seen uh, anecdotally, uh, people sheltering in their cars. I mean, maybe uh, they had to move to higher ground. That radio tends to be their situational awareness of the environment around them, of what the conditions are, if they may be in an area that might not have a good view of what's happening in the real world. And Lieutenant Colonel, whether it's the Florida Turnpike or the New Jersey Turnpike, how many folks do you have coming in from out of state who may not be aware of uh, some of the natural disasters that may be occurring? That's a, a good question, Chairperson. Uh, the, the New Jersey Turnpike uh, sees uh, somewhere over a million, I think, riders a day, uh, you know, on, on, a, on a good day. Um, so I couldn't actually answer, you know, that, that aspect. But again, having, you know, those alerts on our signbirds telling people where to go to get critical information, we tend to tell people to go to AM radio stations. Thanks, my time's expired. The gentleman time has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Georgia, the vice chair of the subcommittee for five minutes. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank each of you for being here. I appreciate it very much. Um, as the Chairman mentioned, I'm from Georgia. I have the honor and privilege of representing the entire coast of Georgia. Obviously, hurricanes are a concern to us. Obviously, the emergency management system is important. Um, you know, one thing to note also, for those of you who may not be familiar with Georgia, that we always say there are two Georgias, there's Atlanta and everywhere else. Well, we're everywhere else in South Georgia, um, you know, so access to, to, to AM radio is important to us and, and very important. But, um, you know, natural disasters like hurricanes are, are traumatic, and oftentimes there's no other means of getting alerts other than the AM radio. So I'm glad to see that companies such as Ford are, um, have reversed their decision to, to remove AM radio in, in, in their EVs based on this information, and I'm hopeful that more will follow suit with that. Mr. Smith, um, in my district, we have Hyundai that is um, building one of their EV plants. In fact, it is the largest economic development project in the history of the state of Georgia. Um, a five and a half billion dollar investment that's going to create over 8,100 jobs, plus probably that many more in ancillary businesses. So we're very excited about it. They've announced that they have um, no plans to remove AM radios from their vehicles as well. So we're, we're encouraged to hear that. Um, can you explain to me why some of the OEMs um, plan to keep AM and others don't? I mean, what's the rationale here? Well, first off, I can't really comment on individual OEM plans, but I will say our manufacturers are very consumer focused and they run focus groups, et cetera, and they look at their various product portfolios and the kind of consumers that use their products and what they want. So I can't say much more than that and other than the fact that it seems like some of our members are um, see value in it. And uh, all of our members, though, see value in providing the full network of, of the IPAWS alerts, and we certainly support that and commit to that. I keep hearing that interference with the, um, with the EV batteries is a problem, that, um, that static and that type of thing. Is, is, is that true? Well, I mean, in general, AM has issues with static and interference. That's something that FEMA's documented. But... Um, I can't say much in terms of very specifics because, again, EVs, even within EVs, are different. They have a number of different motors, different components, different place, places where they're placed. So um, I don't have any particular specific information about the type of shielding or the type of, uh, of um, rec or, uh, recommendations they do or remediations they do in terms of filtering to be able to uh, pull out some of that uh, Static. I, you know, I just got to tell you, I'm a little skeptical of that. I, I have to believe that, you know, if they really wanted to, they could fix that problem. I mean, I, I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, Lieutenant Colonel DeMasi, um, while you serve the great state of New Jersey, as I say, can you tell me how, how my constituents in Georgia 1 would fare in a Category 5 hurricane without AM radio? Uh, thank you for the question, Congressman. Um, when those survivors don't have a sense of what's happening around them, it, it tends to affect <clears throat> adversely their decision-making processes, whether it's to shelter in place or maybe to evacuate. And we want to make sure that those survivors have most critical, up-to-date information possible. Uh, New Jersey, through the Emergency Management Assistance Compact, has assisted Georgia in providing generators in the past to help support power during And we crisis. appreciate that, and it does not go unnoted. Yes, sir. We, we definitely know in a, how important it is to make sure some of those critical pieces of infrastructure come back online as swiftly as possible. And, uh, you know, part of that process is making sure that, you know, you're effectively communicating with your public and AM uh, has that ability to transcend some of those other challenges to the infrastructure. Mr. Chapman, real quick, um, you mentioned in your testimony that AM radio helps those who have poor wireless and broadband signals stay connected. And, uh, you know, again, South Georgia, we don't have the best broadband. We've got some, and, and it's good, but we don't have the, the best. Um, but we got a lot of agriculture, so this would impact um, those in our agriculture sector as well. Um, what What... While this proves that we have a lot of work to do, and particularly on this committee to improve broadband, rural broadband, can you please share the, the um, volume and type of information that these um, communities receive through AM radio? 
So thank you for the question, Congressman. Uh, we have a lot of ag and farm information that we have on our stations, and uh, a lot of that goes on our AM radio stations. It's very important because that's how it's received by those communities, and it's also important to point out that those communities have other ways to receive things, but it's easiest for them when they're out in a combine, something like that, to have it on the AM radio. They have other means, but they still choose an ag uh, information across radio is one of the most important ways it's delivered today. Good. Thank you, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired, and the chair now recognizes the gentleman from California's 29th district for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and ranking member, for having this important hearing. Um, for some people, radio, specifically AM radio, is an outdated medium with a shrinking consumer base. However, in Latino communities, like the one I represent in the San Fernando Valley, radio is one of the most powerful um, and far-reaching forms of media. In November of last year, Nielsen Media Research reported that 97% of Latinos over the age of 18 listen to radio in some form every month. This phenomenon is not unique only to the Latino community. Racial and ethnic minorities in my state and across this country turn to radio for content that is more inclusive of their stories, their culture, and their experiences, and their languages. Uh, Mr. Chapman, I know my colleagues have asked about uh, this because it's an important issue. Can you speak further to what factors allow AM radio to target underserved minority communities more effectively than other broadcast mediums, and whether or not um, radio is um, in one or more languages in America? Congressman, thank you for the question. Uh, an oftentimes overlooked aspect of diversity and voice is the access to entry. And what I'm talking about is the price of a radio station. So AM radio stations are typically much less expensive today than FM radio stations. What that means is somebody wanting to break into our industry that has a, a desire to speak to a specific community, a voice or, or a community of color, um, uh, has the opportunity to get into broadcast ownership where it might be much more difficult with a large general market signal. So that's a very important aspect of how they talk uh, to the community that they're targeting. Um, it's, while it's often overlooked, um, that relationship ultimately, as you reference uh, the high percentage in the Latino community of listening to the station, it is very similar, which also occurs in the African American community. Um, stations that have a diverse uh, uh, listener base oftentimes have the strongest listener base because of the relationship uh, with that community. So cultural competency and ownership does in fact uh, create an environment where this, the business has stands a, a higher likelihood of reaching more people, therefore being more successful? Absolutely. I can tell you by experience, when I was general sales manager of WTLC AM in Indianapolis, if we did not have a message on the air uh, relating to a particular situation, uh, our audience base oftentimes would doubt that it actually was existing or taking place. That relationship, again, is central. Okay. So despite recent improvements, the number of minority-owned commercial broadcast stations still lags significantly, significantly behind their representational share of the U.S. population. Uh, Mr. Chapman, as somebody with experience in purchasing and operating radio stations, I'm wondering if you might have some thoughts or initiatives Congress can take to encourage others to follow your path and expand the number of minority-owned commercial radio stations across the country. All right. Thank you for the question, Congressman. Our industry is at the best when we're reflective of the communities where we operate. Uh, there is an unspoken charge that the radio stations need to speak to the people that are available in the community. And uh, a number of years ago, there was the uh, tax certificate that was available for diverse groups. As broadcasters, we would welcome to see that type of thing in place once again because we know the more that we have a citizenry that is informed of the issues that are taking place, it's the best way to guide people through tough times. Yes, uh, it, it's very important because the, you mentioned earlier uh, what it takes to enter into that industry, that business. It, there are some barriers. Um, 
uh, we um, mourn the loss of somebody who owned radio stations, television stations, who got his opportunity in the early 1970s when the FCC actually said, you know, let's see if we can entice minorities to go ahead and get involved in ownership. And that was Walter Ulloa out of Los Angeles. Uh, grew up in uh, a poor side of town, but ended up doing very, very well and brought a tremendous cultural competency to every station that he was a part of. Um, and therefore was incredibly successful. Um, so one of the things that I'd like to, to see happen, and, and we don't have enough time today, is to see some of uh, your recommendations uh, uh, forwarded to this committee, uh, examples of the past where we've been successful and getting more uh, participation, and then also some, maybe some innovative things we could do going forward. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Florida's second district for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Chairman Latta. As we've all heard today, uh, AM radio continues to be important. Uh, it offers a broad range of programming and essential emergency announcements are transmitted classically on the AM bands. Uh, uh, given the long wavelength of AM radio, we can hear from stations hundreds of miles away, which makes this an ideal form of communications in emergencies. Uh, I'm aware that technology innovations bring changes to the status quo. And we now have FM and satellite radio and internet, et cetera. But, but when the prominent lines of communications fail, when individuals can't access the internet, uh, or when there's a natural disaster, AM radio is the last resort. I don't, for the life of me, I'm not sure why we're discussing getting rid of that at this point particular juncture. I have a few questions for you. Uh, Colonel DeMace, uh, thank you for your time with the panel today. Uh, <clears throat> with your background as a Deputy Director of Emergency Management and many previous roles in this field, I think you know the importance of effective communications during emergencies. And Mr. Chapman, your, your experience in broadcasting is certainly germane as well. In the Florida Panhandle, we suffered a Category 5 hurricane that seriously impacted our lives and our communications. We literally lost all cell phones, landlines, internet, and even our police radio repeaters for nearly two weeks. What we didn't lose was AM radio. <laughs> uh, so with the potential removal of AM radio uh, from most of the major automobile manufacturers, do you think FEMA will be able to communicate effectively with individuals during disasters? Uh, thank you for the question, Congressman. Um, as you mentioned, uh, the redundancy that we have uh, built within the um, integrated public alert and warning system relies upon the AM radio uh, as its most reliable form of communication during those critical moments when those high winds and, and other factors can destroy the actual cellular infrastructure or other means of communication uh, with which we have to communicate with the public. Uh, during a crisis. So uh, I think FEMA recognizes and I they recognize we have yeah. that it's incredibly important to touch. Mr. Chapman, same question. Congressman, thank you. I, I believe that uh, there's all kinds of redundancies that are built into the EAS system. That's why it works well. But for the reasons that we've pointed out, AM sits at the very beginning of the chain. Um, the AM stations are far superior to the other mechanisms uh, in, in uh, the emergency alert system to start it. It's why we chose for 75% of the primary entry point stations to be AM radio stations. So that's, that sounds like a strong, uh, strong affirmation. And Mr. Schmidt, do you have a feeling how much it costs to put an AM radio in a car? No, I don't have an actual cost uh, for an AM radio. Again, it probably varies between individual manufacturers, and those are proprietary and closely held. Um, but again, we are committed and to providing the alerts across the full spectrum of the IPAWS system. And we also have provide just a vast offer of choices for our manufacturers. And oh, by the way, there's still 99% of vehicles on the road today that have AM radio. So we will have AM radio for quite a while as we look at the future and see what makes sense in terms of uh, the iPod system and FEMA's approach. Thank you. So I, I guess I, I'll close on this note. There are 82 million Americans listening to AM radio, and there are 2 million Americans driving electric vehicles. Uh, I, I think it's a pretty 
obvious thing to leave the AM radios alone. With that, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back. Thank you. Thank you. The gentleman yields back, and the chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Michigan for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, AM radio may seem arcane to some. We've already seen in this hearing it currently serves as the backbone of our nation's emergency alert system, providing an important backstop in times of need, and has proven its continued reliability as other networks fail, which is why the announcement by some automakers to remove AM radio from cars has raised significant concerns for Americans. There are valid questions regarding the overall reach of various forms of emergency communications, the depth of information provided by those alerts, free access to alerts, and the resiliency of the infrastructure required to provide these alerts. It is crucial we ensure that all Americans can freely access life-saving information in times of need through interrelated, innovative, and overlapping forms of emergency communication systems. But at the same time, we can't ignore stony technological innovation. Let me start with you, Mr. Schmidt. In your testimony, you mentioned that the Integrated Public Alert and Warning System Program Management Office emphasized in its strategic plan for fiscal year 22-26, difficulties in moving away from radio and broadcast as the primary channels for news and information. In your estimation, if we had an emergency right now, during this very hearing, would you say that the current IPAW system is fully equipped to serve and reach every American in times of emergency without assistance from AM radio? Yes or no? I can't opine on... Yes or no, please. Madam Chairman, I mean, sorry. Congressman Woman Dingell. No, I do not have the ability to answer that question because I am not FEMA. I am not the government. I am not the one that developed this, the program. We are the ones that work with that program to try to support it the best we can. Well, I have talked to them. And the fact of the matter is, based on my conversations, that we are not currently adequately prepared to reach all Americans in the event of a disaster without the assistance of AM radio services as a backdrop. I'm grateful that all the members of the Alliance for Automotive Innovation have committed to providing multiple channels of free emergency alert access to consumers. But we need to get far more specific about how they receive these alerts. Mr. Schmidt, can you share with us through what medium consumers can expect to receive free emergency alerts in automobiles moving forward? Is it digital, analog, FM, AM, satellite, or another technology? And are the companies approaching the issue differently? Thank you for the question. Um, yes, with respect to free, that varies between mediums and even within mediums. So I can't comment. So that's a very context. basic question However, here. What I will say is there are certainly, for example, satellite, where satellite has um, their free Barker channel, which is always there and runs and is without subscription. And there are a lot of the analog C and other mechanisms which are free as well. So, Mr. Chairman, I am going to suggest, uh, for instance, by the way, Tesla does not offer AM now in its vehicles. I believe that this committee should ask every manufacturer whether they're going to how long, what the commitment is, how much it's going to cost, is it going to be streamed, and when they say it's going to be free, what's the definition of free? Now, Mr. Schmidt, how have your member companies also ensured that this medium remains resilient in times of crisis or when wireless network outages occur? Well, again, like I said, iPods is a network of stuff, so it, depending on the uh, specific... Um, <laughs> event, certain mediums are maybe more appropriate than others, and that's why there's... But not everybody may have access because everybody's not telling us exactly how they're going to make sure they have access to those free. Mr. Schmidt, when it, will these emergency alert services come standard in all new vehicles? Is this commitment the same across all member companies, or will there be differences in terms of what emergency communication services they will receive in their new vehicles? Well, I can't comment on individual manufacturers on what exactly is in their program, but there is a commitment that there will be at least some post-free emergency alert received through those vehicles. 
but we don't know whether it's going to be ongoing. I'm going to clearly say consumers should not bear the cost of receiving life-saving emergency information, period. I think it's important that every member company you represent be unambiguously clear about how consumers will receive these alerts free of charge and standard in new vehicles. I have other questions I'd like to submit for the record, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Utah for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to our witnesses. Uh, listen, I come to this meeting a huge fan of AM radio. I remember uh, in the 1980s, I'll date myself, I uh, used to travel uh, in Colorado, and I could uh, listen, tune in to the Salt Lake City AM radio station and listen to local football games and local news. And, um, of course, um, I, I, like many of my colleagues here, want to make sure that AM radio is vibrant and, and is viable for, for many years into the future. But if I'm honest, um, I'm a little conflicted with the concept of the federal government mandating um, how that is done. And so I come to this hearing with an open mind, not with a predetermined judgment, but just simply an open mind. Um, some of those memories also include eight-track tapes, uh, cigarette lighters, uh, manual windows, and um, I find myself asking, gosh, you know, if the eight-track tape industry had lobbied for a mandate to keep eight-track tapes, would we still be listening to eight-track tapes? And I don't think so. Um, so, Mr. Chapman, let's, let's agree that uh, the vibrancy of AM radio is important for entertainment, for education, and clearly, as we've heard today, for emergency situations. But as I travel my district, and I would challenge anybody to have a more rural district than I have in Utah, as a matter of fact, half of my district is actually frontier, I have more success streaming uh, than I do actually getting AM radio signals. And I'm just wondering if we set aside this concept about the cars for just a minute, isn't the vibrancy of AM radio um, really contingent on a transition uh, to streaming? And, and should we be having uh, more conversations, right, about um, how to do that? Look, when I'm here in Washington, D.C., I like to listen to that same local AM station. When I jog on the mall, I can listen to news back home. And um, I don't really care about even an emergency warning here in D.C. Um, I would care about one back more in my district. So could you just explore with me, like, the future of AM radio? And if, if we all agree we want to keep it vibrant, uh, shouldn't we, we be spending more time uh, talking of, uh, about um, transitioning to kind of a new world? Congressman, I appreciate the question. I think it's a fair question. Um, one of the things, we all come with preconceived notions. And one of those is... Uh, when you reference eight track tapes from many years ago, um, I'm part of the generation that grew up with that. And when I listen to AM radio today, I hear static, uh, and it doesn't sound with the same fidelity that FM radio sounds. Um, but for the reasons I pointed out earlier, there are clear superior advantages uh, for AM radio in times of emergency. And so uh, I also recognize uh, uh, that we've discussed that at length this morning. But I think that safety point is... So I guess my point is there's far higher likelihood that I will hear that outside of my car than inside my car. I don't have a car here in D.C. Some of my staff doesn't have a car. And yet if we explore ways for people to access AM radio, aren't, aren't we actually ensuring far more likelihood that they would get those uh, alerts if, if we're making sure that everybody can access AM radio, really almost no matter where they are with today's technology. Uh, by the way, during the hearing, my staff prompted me, and I just put, looked on Amazon, you can buy an AM radio for about $5. For, so those of you who want to know what it costs to add it to a car, right? So this is not a cost issue, right? It, it, it maybe is a technology issue and where, where we're going in the future issue. Yeah, I'll give you a chance to respond, and I want to ask a couple more questions. Congressman, one last point. It was back in January. We were moving our daughter from Denver up to Seattle, and so we drove through large sections of Utah. Um, you know, in our 2013 Toyota Avalon, it's a hybrid, and I can listen to AM radio in that car through that stretch. And there were times where there was not an FM station, and there were times when there weren't AM stations, and they both complement each other in some of those more I, rural areas. I agree, areas. and just for simply for time, I'm going to move on. I would tell you, though, I can better access that AM streaming in my car in rural Utah than I can frequently with stations. Um, Colonel, um, that cigarette lighter in my, in, in my parents' car was often used to start campfires 
and um, could be considered essential for emergencies. Uh, maybe only in rural Utah, right? So in your view, like, are we looking at this through the wrong paradigm? Should we be looking at, at, at new technology? And here again, not to, to, to diminish AM. I want AM to be part of whatever our solution is. But, but what role is new, are we, should we be looking to new technology and its advancements and, and not get stuck in a paradigm that it has to be a traditional AM radio as we think about it? Congressman, great question. Um, no, I think we're always. I, I got to get a super quick answer. Exploring, we're almost out of time. exploring new technologies. Uh, I agree with you 100%. But right now, it's currently constituted an emergency situation. The AM platform is critical to communicate. Okay, and I don't dispute that. It's not the AM platform, it's that thing that is our paradigm that has to be look and feel and act like an old AM radio that I'm questioning. I'm sorry, I'm out of time, Mr. Chairman. I yield. The gentleman yields back, and the chair now recognizes the gentlelady from New Hampshire for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for being with us. I think it's clear from the discussion today that AM radio remains a staple communication channel across the country, including my rural district. From music and talk shows to traffic updates and the news, AM radio is a trusted platform to connect people with what they want to listen to. Many AM broadcast radio stations operate locally and help to keep their listeners informed about what is happening in our community. Most critically, Americans know and trust they can tune into their local AM station to receive alerts and stay safe during emergencies, including snowstorms and other emergencies in my state. For anyone who's ever found themselves caught driving in a sun sudden storm, AM radio is where you turn to first. AM radio is especially important in rural communities where cell coverage can be spotty and broadband services may be limited, and that's classic for my district. For rural Americans, AM radio is a reliable and accessible way to stay connected when it matters most. And while Congress continues to work to connect rural communities and bridge the digital divide, AM radio remains an essential communications channel. That's why I joined our chairman, Mr. Lada, and Representative Pence in sending a letter seeking information from the major automakers on their plans to phase AM radios out of their vehicles. I remain concerned that removing the radios from new vehicles will put rural Americans at risk of not receiving critical emergency alerts and safety information. Lieutenant Colonel DeMays, can you elaborate on other available emergency communication tools and how these tools operate in rural areas? What are the alternatives? So in, in our rural areas, uh, when we push a message through uh, the integrated public alert and warning system, it hits uh, several different pieces of the architecture. One's communicating through those AM and FM platforms, certainly through the television. Uh, communi uh, communicating those critical messages, uh, but also it ties into WIA, the Wireless Emergency Alert System, uh, which again, depending upon the reach of those cellular towers, will hopefully be able to connect with those rural areas. But as we've seen, you know, uh, even in the areas uh, very adjacent to my area in southern New Jersey, which are very rural, some of that cellular reach is very limited. In some cases, that messaging doesn't necessarily reach. Get through. Thank you. AM radio is not the only emergency management tool available, but it's clearly our most reliable tool to reach the wide, widest audience at this time. While I recognize the importance of AM radio, I also support the innovation and development of new technologies, and I think this is where Mr. Curtis was going. Electric vehicles are the future of our nation's transportation system, and we must be careful not to stifle widespread deployment. Mr. Schmidt, how will a potential mandate to require AM radios in all vehicles impact the function and adoption of electric vehicles? Thank you for the uh, question. Um, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, regulation is a blunt instrument, and it's, it goes to per perpetuity. So even if you have vehicles that now have this technology, you're mandating them for forever, basically, and you're looking at a uh, system that FEMA has concerns about, it's uh, declining listenership, and we are looking at more and better ways of trying to deliver alerts. So uh, I'm, I think we're ge generally not against or not in favor of a mandate in this area. And again, uh, we 
have, our commitment is that we are going to be providing as much through the IPAWS network as possible. Consumers have wide range of, of options, and currently there are about 99% of vehicles on the road, which that will not change dramatically in the next future. So we will have time to look at um, how we maybe evolve this system in a more positive way. Thank you. And, and one for more for you, Mr. Schmidt. EV adoption in rural communities is already falling behind for a number of reasons. Will the removal of AM radios be yet another barrier to adoption of EVs in rural communities? Um, as I mentioned, I think we have a pretty a fairly reasonable array of uh, technologies that our EV customers can use to reach and um, get to these uh, these alerts and et cetera. So um, I don't see it as being an impediment for EV penetration. Thank you. Congress has a delicate responsibility of protecting public safety without hampering innovation, and I look forward to our continuing discussion in this committee. And with that, I yield back. Thank you. 15 Jesus. seconds to spare. Well, actually, it was 16 over. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll ignore that. <laughs> the, uh, the gentlelady's time has expired, and the chair now recognizes the gentleman from Pennsylvania for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Lada and Ranking Member Matsui for putting together today's hearing on AM radio. And thank you to the witnesses for providing such valuable insight. My district is in the heart of rural Pennsylvania. Many of my constituents, farmers and rural residents alike, rely every day on AM radio to receive their local news from weather to sports. We hear all too often that information is power, but in my district in Pennsylvania, the information is protection. With that knowledge, we know that FEMA relies on AM radio to provide alerts through the National Emergency Alert System to our communities, thus the protection. With the increasing prevalence of electric vehicles, some have raised concern that the elimination of AM radio will restrict critical access to emergency alerts for those without cell phones. Some believe FM could soon follow. Despite millions of Americans still relying on radio for their news and various, tax, various talk shows, and ultimately for their protection. Mr. Chapman, given that AM radio is often used in times of severe weather and natural disasters, such as tornadoes and hurricanes, what kind of safeguards do these stations have in place to ensure that these alerts are able to reach as many people as possible. Thank you for the opportunity to comment on that, Congressman. I can tell you that every radio station that is part of the network, and it is virtually every station across the country, has certain protocols and systems that they have to adhere to. There's regular testing that takes place, and so unlike the other systems that are in place, we continually go through and make sure that free over-the-air radio is accessible and that there's not holes or gaps in our system. So having that extra layer of protection, having that testing in place to make sure that the holes and gaps are not present, particularly in areas like rural parts of America, do you feel that deleting AM radio will provide a national safety risk? So, so and, and I think that is the biggest question, obviously, that we're talking about right here because uh, the AAS system has redundancies. You know, uh, we've talked about that this morning, but there are parts and roles that AM radio plays in it that cannot be substituted by other forms. You know, uh, it was chosen, and we've talked about it a couple of times, as the primary entry point for the national alerts that go out. And the reason for that is, is those radio stations cover 90% of the United States. There are 60 of the 70-some radio stations that are PEP stations that cover the entire network. And that is the most reliable method that we have in any time of crisis. And that reliability is important. Colonel DeMays, how many cell phones are not capable of the wireless emergency alerts? And could those that are non-capable cell phones be at risk without AM radio to missing emergency, amber, and presidential alerts? especially in rural communities? 
Uh, thank you for the question, Congressman. I don't have the data on, uh, on what that would turn out to be, but I can only state that um, having the AM radio available to communicate those messages out as a backup, whether or not that cellular device is functioning or not, is of critical importance. And as a follow-up, are individuals currently able to opt out of these imminent threat and amber alerts through the WARN Act, defeating the function of this system? And without those mobile alerts, what are the remaining ways to be notified of severe weather? Or are these communication systems in the near future going to be implemented to reach rural constituents like mine during an emergency? Again, I'm, I'm not aware of uh, the process of opting out of certain messaging uh, as for the process, but uh, I can state that we will still leverage other platform forms through the integrated public alert and warning systems, such as television. Um, we have the ability to leverage other sources of communications, such as reverse 911, where you can hit hardline phones, uh, or the through the Resident Connect program. But there, there are multiple means to build that redundancy in communicating with the public. But again, as mentioned throughout the hearing this morning, AM radio is the most consistent, dependable, and reliable, particularly for those areas uh, that are more rural. And I think it's worth, as my time diminishes here, repeating that AM radio is the most consistent, reliable form of communication that we have right now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My time has expired. I yield. Thank you. The gentleman yields back, and the chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Illinois for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I want to thank you and Ranking Member Matsui for holding this important hearing this morning. I also want to thank our witnesses for your testimony to help us better understand why keeping AM radio receivers and new vehicles has become an emerging issue and why these antennas are something so many EV manufacturers have removed from their vehicles. I'm well aware that AM radio receivers and cars play an important role for various subsets of our community. Uh, one of my channels in Chicago that I listen to all the time, WVON, um, they're very important, especially in the black community, uh, in hearing different opinions, getting the word out, what's going on locally, but also uh, nationally also. However, I've also heard from those who argue that AM radio receivers and cars are less of a necessity, as you've been hearing somewhat here today. I'm encouraged by today's hearing because we have uh, members of Congress that we can now be informed by industry leaders as to why and how this um, important this technology is and how useful it is to our constituents. So my district is urban, suburban, and rural. So I want to talk a little bit about, I went from 1,200 farms in the remap to 2,000. So I want to hear, Mr. Chapman, how do local farmers in the field and on rural roadways utilize AM radio and what would be or what is the alternative for my rural constituents if their if AM radio um, was not accessible to them in their cars? Congresswoman Kelly, thank you for the question. Uh, in rural America, um, AM oftentimes is the best vehicle that we have to get out talk programming, uh, extended long form, um, and it's oftentimes not used for songs and things like that. Uh, AM radio stations are the primary point that ag news reaches the community uh, that it's intended. And so uh, AM is central to agriculture, just like it is with uh, uh, communities in, in urban areas. So, um, and according to what my colleague, Ms. Curtis, was trying to say, and somewhat my colleague, Ms. Custer, as far as technology and moving forward, is there any moving forward really for local farmers and rural constituents if we didn't have AM radio? So uh, one of the things that's come up this morning is there are multiple ways for people in this day and age to find different things. Uh, a central point to why this all is really important is AM is the easiest way for people to do it. There are things that uh, people in rural areas can subscribe, subscribe to. Um, but uh, ag news coming over a satellite to a farm um, may not be the best use because of, of the subscription fees that are involved delivering satellite news to that individual farm. Um, satellite radio is another example. Um, all of these things have subscriptions. This is the one mechanism that we have is, that is free to deliver these types of things. Thank you. And 
Colonel, how does AM radio help level the playing field for non-English speakers, especially in emergency situations? Uh, thank you for the question, Congresswoman. Um, as mentioned uh, throughout the hearings today, the uh, relatively low uh, barrier to entry to broadcast to uh, different diverse communities um, through this particular platform make it ideal for us to communicate with underserved and socially vulnerable communities that may not have access to some of those um, resources in their native languages. Uh, the ability of those broadcasters uh, to communicate directly with the groups uh, that they uh, message out to, uh, our information is of critical importance to making sure the public's fully aware of what the, the situation is uh, as it relates to disasters. Thank you, and I'm gonna yield back 57 seconds. Thank you to the witnesses. Thank you, the gentlelady yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Georgia's 12th district for five <coughs> minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, we want the opportunity to uh, address the importance of AM radio, and it's already been mentioned in, in our rural uh, communities. Uh, I represent a large part of George, Georgia's rural community in the southeast, and I, I want to emphasize that AM radio plays an important part in our community, uh, particularly in areas where consistent wireless service is a challenge, and, and, and that's due to factors of pine trees and other things. Um, it, AM radio remains a, a lifeline for my constituents, providing a reliable access to vital admin, uh, information, emergency alerts, and public announcements. It is crucial to understand that in rural areas like mine, AM radio is a critical source of news, information, and entertainment for residents who may have limited access to other communication technologies. The reach and reliability of AM radio signals make it the most dependable means of communication in rural communities as they can penetrate obstacles such as dense vegetation. I have witnessed firsthand how AM radio stations in my district have played a vital role in disseminating information during emergencies and severe weather events, ensuring that our constituents stay informed and safe. I urge the continued collaboration between automakers, radio broadcasters, and technology experts to find innovative solutions that preserve the accessibility and reach of AM radio while addressing the un unique challenges posed by EVs. Uh, Colonel DeMay's uh, IHS market forecasts that by 2035, 40%, 45% of all new car sales will be electric vehicles. From an emergency alerting perspective, if all of these cars or a large subset, subset of them do not have AM radio, what is your confidence level that your state will be able to send notifications that your citizens will receive? Uh, thank you for the question, Congressman. Um, our experience has been during those critical moments and disasters, uh, the cellular networks can tend to be overwhelmed, either through compromise of the uh, infrastructure due to damaging winds, or if it's uh, overload uh, from multiple residents trying to communicate with loved ones, uh, the network uh, can tend to collapse and not be available to the customer base. However, um, as many people in our population that exist are able to access AM radio, no matter the condition. Mr. Chapman, you uh, mentioned how many uh, PEP stations or AM stations in your testimony. Can you elaborate on how important AM is to EA EAS and why other forms of communication don't have the scale and reach that AM does? Thank you, Congressman. AM radio stations uh, are the primary entry point. The national alert would begin on the AM radio stations, um, at least 75% of them. There are some 80 radio stations that are PEP stations. And so that is the beginning point. Those stations were chosen for the characteristics we've talk, uh, talked about already. And it is central to making sure that when there's an important message, it gets out in a way that can be received by the other stations that are part of the EAS network. We begin with our most important that can reach with the uh, most number of people, and then we go to the next level, which is an LP1, and then we go to the next level, which is an LP2. It begins with the PEP <laughs> stations.
Thank you. Uh, Mr. Smith, have there been studies on how AM radio has interfered with or inter interfered with or interfered with the spectrum utilized in autonomous vehicles? I'm not aware of it. Uh, Mr. Chapman, from my understanding, the issue with electric vehicles is that the drive train generates electromagnetic frequencies on the same wavelength as analog AM radio signals, which heavily interferes with the signal quality. Is that correct? Congressman, uh, uh, Toyota Motor Company has got roughly 5.1 million electrified vehicles on the road. That's more than all the other combined automakers uh, in the United States. Some of those are hybrid, some of them are electric vehicles, um, and they've determined that they've got a way to isolate the noise. Uh, it's not an issue. Um, you know, I can tell you that the early electric vehicles had AM radios in, in them, and uh, most of the vehicles that were manufactured before 2015 all had AM radios in it. So there's been some change for some reason. Um, electromagnetic interference can be protected in these cars. Okay. And as far as the uh, AM radio signals, uh, did they experience the same kind of inter interference as analog signals? Analog and digital stations interfere interference, but it presents itself in different ways. Okay. Uh, what, what would be the cost of uh, upgrading a tower from analog to digital? This is a, a, a cost that varies by radio station, but it would be a significant cost. Um, so uh, it would be difficult unless I was commenting on, right. on a particular tower, a particular transmission facility. Okay. Thank you so much. And uh, with Ms. Ms. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. And the chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Texas for five minutes. Thank you so much, uh, Chairman Latta and Ranking Member Matsui for convening today's hearing. Um, and thank you to all of our witnesses for the time that you've taken this morning to testify. Um, it is not surprising to me as I go toward the end of the questioning that a lot of the things that I had uh, prepared to talk to you about this morning have already been covered. Um, but I do want to, um, to talk about just a couple of those things and follow up on some of the good questions that have been asked and some of the questions, uh, some of the answers that you've given. Um, of course, uh, I represent uh, the Houston, Texas area, and so we are very familiar with um, the importance of AM radio for emergency alerts as well as for all the other purposes we've been talking about here this morning. And um, I know my constituents care deeply about this issue in the last um, just a couple of months as this issue has, has um, been more and more uh, in, the, in the news and in our conversations. I've heard from hundreds of constituents uh, in a very organic way um, about their concerns about making sure that they can continue to have access to AM radio. And so um, there are certain things we've touched on and I just want to emphasize are, are really important to us. We've talked a little bit about the importance of being able to communicate in different languages. Uh, in my own district, in our area, uh, more than 140 languages are spoken. Um, the idea that you can get to various communities through AM radio is absolutely um, borne out in our district and really important for communicating uh, within the district. Um, and of course, we are no stranger to um, weather disasters and other emergencies, uh, unfortunately, summer and winter. Um, and this has been a critical lifeline for us. And so these really are the priorities of, of our community. And, and you all have talked a lot about that this morning. So I appreciate your insights. Um, it's been incredibly helpful. Um, what I'm not totally sure, uh, Representative Allen was just asking a couple of questions about this, and I think Mr. Chapman, you were just saying, something has changed recently. Um, and I'm not sure we've gotten the answer today about why exactly this move is being made, why the manufacturers specifically and the cars are, are thinking about removing it. There's some suggestions about um, whether there's interference with the AM signal and, and the um, cars, but as you said, this is, We've had electric cars for going on two decades now, and this is a more recent issue. So I think that's something that I would really like to understand better, kind of why it's happening. And I'm not sure we've got um, the answer to that question this morning. Um, and then the other thing that um, Mr. 
Mr. Curtis touched on that I think is also important um, was this question about the transition um, and the difference between digital and analog. I too love listening to my digital radio here in DC and I tune it to my Houston public media station and, and listen to what's going on at home um, every single morning. Um, but those, those are the questions and I think it goes together kind of this, what's the change? Does it have to do with digital versus analog? And so I'm gonna look to you, um, uh, Mr. Schmidt, um, if you could just talk a little bit and, and try to give us a concise answer on why this is happening now, um, and then maybe turn to you, Mr. Chapman, for a final comment if we have time. Thank you for the question. Um, with respect to changes over time, I have to admit uh, my expertise is in the safety end and not in the actual EV architecture. So I'm going to have to come back with you with some information. Uh, I think it's it's a great question and, and begs the information, but we will provide that for you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I would appreciate that if you could supplement. I know we'll have a couple of weeks um, at the end of the hearing to, to supplement the record, and I, I think it's really important um, for us to understand that. And so um, I, I guess can I ask sort of two related questions, Mr. Chapman, one based in your experience, um, and two, uh, what we've heard is that there there is a move toward digital that could be part of it, but also can you speak to whether, not just the expense, um, but the differences you might see in terms of reach, resiliency, and kind of um, the depth and, and strength of the analog and digital signals. Like I said, I love my digital radio, but can you just talk to that and, and what those concerns and issues might be as well in your answer? Thank you, Congresswoman. I listened to you talk about Houston and Harvey. Our son was in Houston at that time when 60 some inches of rain and less and a little more than a day were dumped on the community. Um, and I'll, I'll touch on the digital thing in a moment. But uh, what was important is he was prepared because he knew the power was gonna go out. He parked his car in a parking garage up on the second level. And so he was going to be in a place at least where he could get information. Um, and the power did go out, and sometimes it was out and on for extended periods. And so that, that is a way I think a lot of people who are in hurricane areas prepare when something like that comes up. Uh, just to touch on digital very quickly, uh, it is an option down the road, but right now, uh, broadcasting and all digital, there's a station that's doing it here in Frederick, Maryland. Um, most people can't receive it. It's only a small percentage of the receivers. It's not an option that's available to us yet. It should be explored, but EAS depends on analog stations. Well, thank you for that. Uh, I appreciate that. And I will just add as I uh, yield back that uh, I too have a weather radio. It's a great thing to have if you're in an area like ours that's entirely weather. But um, I think it's critically important that we preserve this, this ability to communicate with everyone in times of disaster. Um, and that's certainly true of our experience in Houston. So again, Mr. Chairman, I thank you so much for holding this very important hearing and I yield back. Thank you. The general, general lady's time has expired and yields back. The chair now recognizes the, the gentleman from Ohio's 12th district for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you all for being here today. Uh, there's no question about the importance of AM radio to my constituents in central and southeastern Ohio. Farmers rely on AM radio for their weather and crop reports. And as you mentioned in your testimony, Mr. Chapman, individuals and families living in broadband deserts rely on AM to stay connected to their communities. Mr. Chapman, in your testimony, you often refer to the AM signal as resilient. Can you please briefly explain the difference between AM and FM signals and why you believe the AM signal is more resilient than the FM? Congressman, thank you for the question. Uh, Touching uh, on the difference in properties, say, for example, between AM and FM, the FM signal is much shorter. The AM signal is a much longer wavelength. And what that means is a longer wavelength travels a much larger distance. So that's one of the properties. It also will go through solid objects, unlike what a shorter FM signal will. So there's ways that it can uh, certainly adapt. And in the evening, for example, you know, those that might listen to an AM radio station hear one from a great distance away. So there's different things that are signal properties that are really important to the AM band that the FM band doesn't possess. Okay, thank you. Um, as my colleague, Ms. Fletcher, said, a lot of the questions have been asked, but in a little different dynamic here, we have been hearing a lot about the analog versus the digital AM radio signals. In 2020, the FCC issued a report and order authorizing AM radio stations to voluntarily transition to an all-digital signal. 
Back to you again, Mr. Chapman. I apologize. Do any of your AM radio stations broadcast on a digital signal, and can you explain the benefits and drawbacks of digital AM radio signal versus a traditional analog signal? Congressman Balderson, I would welcome the opportunity, uh, if it was a good opportunity for us to uh, transition to digital AM. Uh, unfortunately, most of our listeners can't receive digital signals on the AM band. Uh, there's differences in the receivers and such. And so um, for the same reason, it's important to keep uh, AM radio and cars in its current format. Uh, it's important for us to give access to all Americans for AM in its current form. And uh, it would require a change or receiver standards which is a different question entirely. And so the reason we don't make that transition is people wouldn't hear us any longer. Okay. Do you know if, if any of the AM stations operating as FEMA primary entry points currently broadcast through a digital signal? No, they do not. All right, thank you. You're all done from my questioning. <laughs> Mr. Schmidt, thank you for being here. Uh, in the case of electric vehicles, the batteries interfere with the AM signal requiring filters or shielding to be installed to prevent interference. Following up on my question to Mr. Chapman, is interference only an issue with the traditional analog AM signal, or would we see the same interference occur with the digital receiver installed with electric vehicles? Unfortunately, I am, again, a safety engineer, and so I don't have the expertise on that at this moment, but I can certainly bring that back to you. Okay. Did you want to raise your hand, Mr. Chapman? Electromagnetic interference has different properties for each band, but if it affects AM, chances are it would affect FM also, whether it was in the digital or the analog structure. And so the shielding that takes place in cars needs to protect AM and FM, and that's generally how they're designed. Okay. Thank you very much for all of you being here today. Mr. Chairman, I yield back my remaining time. Thank you. The gentleman yields back, and the chair now recognizes the general lady from New York for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> and let me thank our ranking member as well. Let me thank our panelists for joining us today to discuss this important issue. With the rapid pace of technological advances in communication technology uh, over the past two decades, it would be easy to overlook the important role that AM radio has historically played in keeping us all informed, safe, and connected. In addition to often being a primary source of news for immigrant communities, AM radio signals travel farther and can reach far more people than FM radio. What AM radio may lack in sound quality, it more than makes up for in reach and resiliency, making it an essential component of our national public warning system. The redundancies that AM emergency broadcasts provide ensures that Americans have a reliable channel to receive critical information in time of crisis and natural disasters. Additionally, AM radio stations play a crucial role in increasing the diversity of media ownership as they are more likely to be owned by women in minority ownership groups than FM stations and other media. The premature demise of AM radio would represent a significant blow to efforts to promote diversity and inclusion in media ownership and limit the diversity of programming available to consumers. With that being said, I'm also extremely proud of the American automakers that have stepped up to help usher in a clean energy future by shifting more towards electric vehicles. The transportation sector has long been ripe for decarbonization, and I commend the automotive industry for moving quickly to make a zero emission transportation future a concrete reality instead of simply a possibility. And as we move towards the future, it is essential that industry leaders and policymakers alike keep public safety concerns at top of mind. We can and must safeguard our clean energy future without sacrificing essential communication channels in the present. Mr. Schmidt, first let me thank you for your organization's plainly stated commitment to ensuring that drivers continue to have access to public alerts and safety warnings. As you stated in your testimony, there are any number of reasons why automakers make certain choices on vehicle design and features offered. 
I'd like to get a better understanding of the technological issues at play with respect to AM in EVs. And while explaining decisions to remove AM radio from EVs, some manufacturers have cited electromagnetic interference generated from electric batteries or motors as among the factors impacting that decision. Nevertheless, in a reversal of its decision to remove AM radio from 2024 models, Ford indicated that it plans to issue a software update to vehicles already on the road without AM radio. Mr. Schmidt, my question is, when it comes to addressing electromagnetic interference, are the solutions rooted in hardware, software, or a combination of both? Well, as I mentioned from the Ford perspective, they had the hardware in the vehicle. <clears throat> they were planning to remove AM radio, so it was easy to remove it by software. And then when they reversed their decision, they just did use software to bring it back. So I would say that I can't say anything for any other manufacturers other than Ford because they authorized me to, and they, I had communications with this Got committee you. So it's, well. it remains to be seen. Yeah. Mr. Chapman, in your testimony, you spoke to the importance of AM radio search and focus on local communities, excuse me, reach and focus. Can you expound briefly on why AM radio is so important for rural minority and historically underserved communities and how these communities could be impacted by the demise of AM radio? Congresswoman Clark, one of the uh, uh, things that we touched on earlier but is really important is the opportunity to get into ownership. We need our ownership to be reflective of the communities where we operate. The cost of entry for an AM station is much less than an FM station. And so oftentimes the stations that program to specific groups um, that may not be the general market have chosen to go in because it's a business model that's sustainable for them with that cost of entry. Very well. Mr. Chairman, I yield back the balance of my time. A gentleman yields back. We'll go next to my colleague from Texas. Congressman Fluger, you'll recognize for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you to the witnesses for being here. Uh, I want to start, um, Lieutenant Colonel uh, DeMay is just, you know, asking a quick question about the security implications. I'm a military guy myself. You always need backup communications, you know, and, and I, I see kind of that baseline backup um, and something that our emergency systems completely depend on. Just give me, a, uh, you know, a brief statement on what AM radio does as a kind of a uh, baseline backup emergency broadcast system and what, what it does for our, our security in this country. Uh, thank you, Congressman. Uh, sure, as a military guy, you call the old phrase, one is none, two is, two is one, and three is almost what you need. Uh, in the case of emergency management, the ability to have redundancy with a variety of platforms knowing again, as I mentioned earlier, that Murphy's Law at some point will intervene, uh, and one, if not multiple platforms will fail at the most critical moment is, is something that we build into our emergency management processes. We wanna make sure that all those resources are available to communicate with the public during a crisis. The AM radio platform in and of itself has the greatest reach of all of our forms of communication with the public and has been proven uh, to be the most consistently reliable. Well, very good. You know, I think to uh, our local broadcaster in Midland, Texas, Craig Anderson, and, you know, the ability to get information, much needed information out to um, the population is so important. Um, and it's, it's one of the, uh, the keys, you know, for broadcasting that, uh, that we need. Um, Mr. Chapman, from a, from a broadcasting perspective, um, can you talk to me about the differences between, you know, the digital and analog uh, broadcast and, and you know, is it changing? And again, like, like my colleagues, Mr. Curtis uh, and others have said, I want to keep an open mind here, but, but I know for sure that we need AM radio in this country. Uh, and, and can you talk to me about digital and analog differences? Sure. Thank you, Congressman, for the question. Uh, I'll talk real quickly in terms of the differences with AM uh, in terms of how it's broadcast. What we're most familiar with and what we all listen to is analog AM. Um, the other end of the spectrum is digital AM. And the receivers today, very few of them can receive all digital. Um, what we're also familiar with is what is called hybrid. 
and that is stations that in band deliver both digital and analog broadcasting. The challenge is for the hybrid broadcasting, it is not a reliable system, it is very finicky, it's tricky to keep it operating well, but it's what we chose as a country through the commission to get to the digital place that we needed on the AM band. The station I mentioned earlier in Frederick, Maryland is broadcasting in all digital. It sounds like a CD, it's wonderful, but we can't listen to it unless we have the radio that receives it. It's a great point. So I, I think, you know, wanted to establish the fact that AM radio is a national security issue. It's, it's an issue for our emergency management system. The receiver is important in this. When I listen to KWell in Midland, Texas, uh, I, I, you know, myself and many other ranchers, farmers, people that are in the oil fields, they may not have um, a digital receiver uh, or a hybrid receiver. So, Mr. Schmidt, I, I recently signed on to a letter, and upstairs we're having a committee hearing on mandates from another federal agency. So I, I'm, I'm not a mandate, uh, pro-mandate kind of a person, but I am very concerned about the lack of AM uh, radios in vehicles. And I'd like to hear, um, you know, what your thoughts are on how we uh, continue to allow private markets to work, um, but also allow our, our population to have the ability to tune in because it really is a national security issue. Yeah, thank you for the comment and question. Uh, yeah, I'm, as I reiterated, I think our members are fully in, uh, committed to providing a plethora of options and mechanisms through the iPod system. AM radio is one of them. Um, we also, our, our members go through and look at the consumer demands, consumer listenership, and that folds into their uh, individual product decisions, which I can't um, elaborate on any further. Um, but it is, manufacturers now offer a kind of a dizzying amount of options, and I think that's good. Um, and we look forward to working with the federal government, FEMA, and the IPAWS and trying to strengthen the whole system, because I do understand and, and recognize through the various strategic plans that even FEMA has concerns about AM radio's future because of the declining listenership. And so we have to look forward at what we can do to provide the kind of the, the nation with what they need. Thank you. I, I would encourage that. It's very important. Um, this is foundational to our national security and to getting uh, information out to the populace. Um, and with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. A gentleman yield back. We will go next to the gentlewoman from Tennessee, Ms. Harshbarger. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for being here today um, to come to testify. You know, this is just my opinion, but I think taking uh, AM radios out of a car is a bad decision by automakers. Uh, most of the people in my district put gas in their cars or gas or diesel in their trucks, and they don't drive EVs. And a lot of them have computers <clears throat> that they don't get on very often, and they don't have smartphones. Um, and Mr. Smith, you know, my question to you is, are manufacturers considering cutting AM and gas-powered vehicles? And I say that because I heard something that uh, Mr. Chapman said earlier, and he alluded to that. Well, as I've mentioned, we are committed for a full range and plethora of options for getting these systems. And individual company decisions on specific technologies is not something I really can comment on. Okay, that's fine. Um, Mr. Chapman, you said in your statement earlier, most PEP stations are AM radio stations because their signals can cover vast areas, some with a 700 mile coverage radius and travel better through solid objects like mountains. I represent East Tennessee. All we have is mountains. We have the Great Smoky Mountains. And, uh, you know, FEMA has invested millions in these stations, and they're battle-hardened and to withstand various national disasters, of, you say, and uh, terrorism, so we're able to communicate critical information. You also say that wireless emergency alerts are not as reliable in these situations as cell towers can be damaged, and networks are overwhelmed by high call volume. And Lieutenant Colonel, you talked about some of the forest fires, uh, severe weather events and forest fires. And, you know, I represent Great Smoky Mountain, Sevier County, and we had a wildfire last year that destroyed numerous homes. And we had a huge, one of the worst disasters in Tennessee in 2016 with the fires in Gatlinburg, and we lost a lot of lives. And there, was, there were communication problems. 
they were overwhelmed. The radio systems were overwhelmed. And that's why I feel like we absolutely need to keep the AM radio service as, um, you know, an emergency system. And, you know, I guess uh, we're paying consumers to buy EVs, which is indirectly a subsidy to automakers. And you can tell me if you agree with this, but uh, maybe we should think about removing that tax credit for EVs if they don't have an AM radio system. But it is a, an important, in, incredibly important thing to keep these um, avenues open for things like that. Lieutenant Colonel, do you have anything to add about the emergency broadcast systems and how important they are? Uh, thank you for the opportunity, Congresswoman. I, I agree. Uh, we have some rural areas in New Jersey, surprisingly, as much as we might look like a very suburban, urban state. And uh, the reach of the cellular networks in some of those areas, particularly an area where we just had a forest fire this past mm -hmm. week, was very limited. Yeah. And the communication means with those individuals, uh, if they had to evacuate, would almost uh, primarily been through the AM radio and yeah. to communicate with those partners. Yeah, that's the issue. And I have two distressed counties where, when I said that earlier, it wasn't to, to say that we're not a sophisticated district. It's to say that a lot of people don't have those smartphones. A lot of people don't use or access computers because we have the lack of broadband. So um, my opinion, it's critically important to keep AM service going. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. We'll go next to the gentleman from uh, Idaho, Mr. Fulcher. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A uh, question for uh, Lieutenant Colonel DeMace. Uh, in terms of emergency broadcasting, it's my understanding that uh, you're Deputy State Director of Emergency Management, and you've also had roles in the uh, State Emergency Response Commission. Uh, would you just share for a moment about the footprint of AM versus other emergency broadcasting uh, channels. What percentage of emergency broadcasting would you say goes currently through AM channels? That's a technical question. I don't necessarily have the exact scope and answer to. Um, I, I'm, I'm kind of understanding your, your could meaning. You, could you just speak to the, to the level of dependence that our emergency systems have on AM versus other uh, yes, other options uh, in our rural areas certainly that percentage of dependence will be much higher uh, than the cellular networks in that there's areas believe it or not in New Jersey where there's no cellular connectivity whatsoever uh, in many cases we're seeing a transition throughout our society where people are uh, not you know uh, securing landlines as much anymore and, and relying on cellular networks for their communications means um, so to the point of when we have that crisis and that emergency happens and that person is either at their residence or maybe in transition through an area with very limited cellular connectivity, uh, the AM radio band would be one of the primary means for us to communicate. Okay, so it is significant. That. It's a significant uh, uh, vehicle for communications of emergency. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, Mr. Schmidt, uh, there's been a couple questions that's come your way in this regard, and I don't know that I really got a good understanding of your comments on it. Maybe that's on purpose, maybe it's not. But how is it that not all auto manufacturers are having the same issues with interference when it comes to emergency vehicles? Well, interference, you know, my understanding of interference is dependent on vehicle architecture. And different, even within various EVs, those architectures change. Motors can be in different places. The electronic devices can be different places. The receiver can be at different places. In space, EMF drops off rapidly with space. So what may be a, a, an issue with one that one manufacturer versus another and the, and the remediation from one to the other will be somewhat different. And I really can't comment since I'm not um, aware of specific architectures, but I think there are differences in how vehicle manufacturers are our vehicles are constructed and the kind of levels of EMF and the levels of shielding needed, and also maybe within the software used to uh, filter the signals to clean them up. And so, so let me ask you this, because I'm, I'm having a hard time just on the technical front, having just a little bit of technical background uh, with the, the response from some 
that this is a technical issue, that it's just uh, an interference that, uh, uh, you know, just can't be overcome or it's just too cumbersome. We've heard things about uh, the shielding expense, the the weight. Uh, do you buy into the to to that? Do you or or you're a safety person? Is there a safety implication to this? And from a safety standpoint, I think it's very critical, and that's where our commitment comes from: is that we're looking at all avenues of the IPAWS to provide uh, alerts. Our members are uh, committed to doing that, and. Um, we have provide many, many ways of getting information out through our vehicles now. Um, so that's our. That's so in terms of, of implementing an AM option, there, there, you're, you're not aware of safety concerns uh, in terms of, of the actual implement in the vehicle? Uh, no. Mr. Chapman, would you care to, to address any of that? I mean, uh, again, uh, just to reframe my comment, I'm struggling with just this idea that, oh, wait, we, we, we have technical obstacles. We can't get this put in place. But yet some suppliers, some uh, manufacturers seem to be able to get this handled, and, and some do know. Can you comment on that? Congressman, I think that's a fair question. I'm a broadcaster. Uh, there are some automakers that have chosen to figure it out and other maker, automakers have not. So uh, I, I, other than that, I don't know how to answer it. You did ask a moment ago about number of radio stations. There's roughly 15,000 commercial radio stations across the country. 4,500 of those are AM radio stations. To put into perspective, you know, the emergency alert system. And thank you for that. I'll wrap up my comments with this, but I think you said a key word uh, in your answer, you said they have chosen to work this out, and I think that's exactly right. Yield back. Gentleman yields back. We'll go next to my colleague from Ohio. Congressman Johnson, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for allowing me to wave on to today's hearing. You know, AM radio reception is an important communications asset for rural Appalachian areas, including much of my district in eastern Ohio. Personally, I appear frequently on AM radio shows as a way to communicate with constituents in my district. But more importantly, it's a necessary and critical public safety asset, especially for remote areas where broadband and even cellular service are not always available. I'm pleased that my legislation, H.R. 1353, the Alert Parity Act, recently passed the House of Representatives as it calls for the establishing of rules through which Providers of emergency connectivity service can provide access to 911 and emergency alerts in unserved areas. Uh, it's unfathomable for many to understand that there remains in America remote areas that still lack reliable cellular service. And removing AM radio receivers from vehicles in rural America would only compound the issue by cutting off access to the backbone of our nation's emergency communications infrastructure in areas that have truly limited communication options already. Thank you, Chairman Lada, for holding this important hearing, and thank you to our witnesses for providing your valuable insight on this issue today. Mr. Schmidt, um, you stated in your testimony uh, that the Integrated Public Alert and Warning System, or IPAWS, was designed to provide redundant alert mechanisms to ensure the public has access to multiple outlets to receive emergency alerts. As I just mentioned, there are remote areas in my district that lack cellular and broadband service. If AM radio receivers are removed from vehicles, can you please discuss the options people who live or travel in these remote areas will have for receiving emergency alerts and public safety information. Thank you for that question. And yes, as you mentioned from my, we are committed for looking at going through the whole range of the IPAWS subs because that is a safety network as well. And there are uh, things such as satellite that do have very strong coverage across the nation as well. Um, so each, each part of that uh, um, network has pros and cons, and I think that's why FEMA is looking to try to diversify it and, and even modernize it because I think, again, I think our view is we're technology forward and we're trying to look at how to address some of the issues that FEMA has already identified with AM and how to move it forward for the future. 
Well, d- 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 let me let me expand on that question. Let me let me ask it a different way. So, no cellular, no broadband. Um, seems to me like in many areas of the country, uh, and and if we take AM out, the only available communication that many people will have in rural areas is satellite. Correct. Okay, all right. Well, Mr. Chapman, uh, as you know, broadcasters stepped up during the COVID pandemic to continue providing local communities with fact-based journalism, breaking news, and support for local businesses. What was the role of AM radio in this type of coverage? Congressman, thank you for the question. One of the things that we did early on, we did fundraisers for local businesses. This is as small town as it gets. We opened up the mics and we started selling business cards for those businesses, and that money all went to those local businesses. That's one way that radio steps up. Another way is the increased investment that we've made in our news operation. Uh, Towns like Anderson, Indiana, have been through a lot. Uh, They need somebody to help them understand complex issues. When we up our news department on WHBU, it means that we're having more people to deal with those issues to have it on the radio so the community can have a better understanding. Okay. It's it's the same thing we've done with reprogramming one of our stations. It's to help the community understand. Okay. In your view then, are there benefits of AM radio for rural communities that cannot be provided through other means? Absolutely. We have those two examples I just shared with you. Okay. All right. Mr. Chairman, I yield back an entire 21 seconds. I thank the gentleman for yielding back. Uh, Looks like I'm batting cleanup, so I'll recognize myself for five minutes. I want to thank you for your testimony today. Uh, You've done a really good job of illustrating why AM radio is so important, Mr. Chapman. I found your uh, testimony about the incident uh, with your family and the train derailment to be very poignant. Uh, But I want to echo the comments of several of my colleagues, most recently Congressman Pfluger, in saying that normally I'm not a, a big fan of government mandates. Uh, You know, I think that consumers are generally uh, very intelligent about deciding what they're willing to pay for and why, as long as it's explained to them. So the question that we're debating today is whether or not the Department of Transportation should be empowered to mandate that an AM radio be part of every new car sold. Uh, So I want to direct a couple of my questions to getting to the heart of that. (coughs) Mr. Schmidt, uh, do you know about how much a inclusion of an AM radio adds to the cost of a a car? Thank you for the question. As I mentioned, I think before you came in, that that's information that I don't have as firm grasp on. Um, That's individual for each manufacturer and their individual systems and what uh, kind of remediation levels they need to provide on it. Okay, so, I mean, I think it's fair to say it's probably not a dollar it's probably, I don't know, in the, in the $100 range, something like that. Does that sound fair? I really don't know because I <laughs> don't. I'm just guessing because I know the, it's, not, it's more than just the equipment. There's a, an antenna, an AM radio antennas have to be uh, quite long and installed in the car. So, I mean, let, let's just say it's, it's, it's in that range of that figure. And without arguing one side or another, uh, how would you articulate the argument to a consumer who says, Look, that's $100 of my money. I don't want an AM radio. I've got other, other means of, uh, uh, of getting emergency information. Uh, so, you know, why are you forcing me, you know, Department of Transportation, to pay $100 or more for this equipment that I don't want? Was that addressed to me? I'm sure. Sorry. Well, no, I mean, it's a hypothetical conversation with a consumer who's saying, you know, to you, I don't want to be forced to, be, to pay $100 for equipment that I don't want and won't use. Yeah, I think our position is that we think mandates are a blunt instrument, and um, especially uh, for a technology that, as FEMA has said, is, has some declining uh, uh, listenership. And so uh, I think, you know, it's, again, I'm, I think it's important for the consumers to understand and make those decisions. Okay, fair enough. Um, Lieutenant Colonel DeMays, uh, I, I really enjoyed your testimony, and uh, one of the things that stuck with me is the statistic that you cited that uh, a third of AM radio listeners are 60 years of age or older. And uh, I think that that sounds about right. In fact, it might be 
uh, in my experience, might be a little low. Uh, one concern that I have, though, is that in modern cars, the AM radio system is buried so far in the user interface, I question whether or not consumers can even find it. So if I, if I put my mother in my car that is just, it's all touch screen and it's, you know, it's, I, and ask her to tune in on AM radio station, I'm not sure she could do it. Uh, what, what, what do you think about that? As a, thank you, Congressman. That's a very uh, interesting point. And I think it goes down to the preparedness uh, component of emergency management. We want people to exercise their plan, so to speak. And whatever that plan might be in the crisis, make sure that they know what works. Uh, the time to sort out where those things are isn't in the middle of the storm. It's prior to. Uh, while there may take some education and outreach associated with achieving that goal, uh, it's a worthwhile endeavor. Mm -hmm. Right, I, I completely agree with you. Um, Mr. Uh, Chapman, uh, you know, your, your testimony was very moving to me about the, uh, the experience that you had with the train derailment. Uh, you mentioned that getting the information that you got over the AM radio, uh, w that was the only solution at the time because cell phones at the time were not capable of delivering that information, but now they are. So, uh, and, and they do it in a way that is fundamentally different from radio, which is, you know, a one directional stream of information, whereas the cell phone, you could say, hey, what just happened? What does that glow? And it can answer you. So uh, why would, does, you know, a, as technology changes, as the way cars are equipped is changing, why should our method of delivery for this emergency information not change with it? Congressman, thank you. I, I think it's a fair question. We've evolved uh, the FEMA uh, mechanisms from Conrail early on uh, 50 years ago to our, our uh, current form of alerts. It is important okay. that we recognize how to evolve things, but at the same time, we can't <clears throat> stop and make a hard no and say that we're no longer going to access a significant portion of the population, which this would do right now. Um, it's important to look at innovation, but we don't have a ready fix to do at this point in time with the removal of AM from the EAS system. Right. Well, I want to thank you very much uh, for everyone for their testimony. We have no questioners left here in the room. So uh, I ask unanimous con consent to insert in the record the documents included on the staff hearing documents list. Without objection, that will be the order. And seeing no further members to be recognized, thank you very much for your testimony and for your willingness to be here today to educate uh, all of us on this important issue. There being no further business before the subcommittee, I, uh, oh, okay, I remind members that they have 10 business days to submit questions for the record. I ask the witnesses to respond to the questions promptly, and I know you will. Members should submit their questions by the close of business on Tuesday, June the 20th. Without objection, the subcommittee is now adjourned. <laughs>